I, Dr. Nada, on the behalf of ophthalmology department, I'm an additional professor and head uh, in Ames, Gatinda. So I'll introduce all the um, uh, speakers as well as chairpersons. So we'll be having uh, chairpersons, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Mittal, he is professor and head at Ames, uh, Rishikesh, and uh, Dr. Ramandeep Singh, I welcome you, sir. Dr. Ramandeep Singh, he is professor and uh, his specialties are vitreoretinal surgery and he is uh, in P uh, Advanced Eye Center, uh, PJMEA Chandigarh. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Dr. Amit Raj, he is additional professor and uh, head in Ames, um, uh, Patna. Uh, I welcome you, sir, for your um, gracious sure. presence. Uh, then I'm uh, introducing uh, Dr. Munish uh, Dhawan. Uh, he's a uh, HOD and um, he's alumni of uh, AIMS uh, New Delhi and he's a, a professor and head in uh, uh, Freedcode Medical College, uh, Government Medical College. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Munish Dhawan. Please uh, feel comfortable and uh, <laughs> enjoy your talk also because the topic with him is he's not very comfortable with that. <laughs> but it's okay. Thank you and all this. And I welcome uh, Dr. Anupam. Uh, she is additional professor uh, in um, Ames uh, Rishikesh. And good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and uh, good thank morning, you for joining uh, us. Dr. Uh, now, uh, so uh, here, Dr. Satish Gupta, he is visible to all. Uh, he is our uh, dean and um, of uh, Ames Vatinda. So now I'll morning, invite. Sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I'll just uh, invite our uh, director, sir. Good morning, sir. Um, so our uh, worthy director, uh, Professor uh, D.K. Singh, uh, he has uh, recently joined and uh, we welcome him. Sir, our uh, chairpersons and speakers, they have joined this virtual meet. Shall we start, sir? Uh, sir, please unmute us. Uh, uh, sir, shall we start? We're going to start. OK, sir. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I am Dr. Lavi Mangla, Senior Resident in Department of Ophthalmology, Ames Bhatinda. Uh, I welcome Dr. D.K. Singh, sir, Executive Director and CEO uh, at our institute, Ames Bhatinda. Dr. Satish Gupta, sir, Dean in Ames Bhatinda. All my seniors, colleagues, and juniors to the CME organized by Department of Ophthalmology, uh, Ames Bhatinda. On the themes, uh, side, threat, uh, side threatening ocular infections and update. Now I would like to invite Dr. Anuradha Raj, additional professor and uh, HOD, to deliver welcome address and introduction to CME. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Lavi. Um, hello, everyone. I'll start uh, this uh, CME with this saying, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is always the key to success. If we love what we are doing, we will be always successful in all the spheres of life. A very good morning to everyone present here on this virtual platform. To welcome is to show honor. To welcome is to establish integrity. While it is obvious to feel uh, happy to deliver welcome address, I'm also very much obliged and uh, excited and feeling blessed to be playing this uh, to play this role. I, Dr. Nada Raj, on the behalf of uh, ophthalmology department, Ames Bhatinda, welcome you all. Star shines at night and star shine at bright daylight. It is our pleasure to welcome our uh, one such star, our honorable uh, director, sir, who is the chief guest director, sir, uh, and Dr. D.K. Singh, sir, who is the great torch bearer and playing a very much uh, important and key role in sculpturing all the faculty and student of this institute to bring best out of us. His untiring effort and ocean of uh, experiences creates the uh, infinite zeal in us to excel beyond boundaries. He is the one who puts his soul and heart in uplifting our morals, ethics, and dignity. So we welcome your, uh, we celebrate your leadership and we keep on influencing, uh, you keep on influencing us. I wholeheartedly welcome our Dean Sir, uh, Dr. Satish Gupta, who, who always motivate us to work in a congenial environment. He is always motivational mm -hmm. in all aspects of life. I wholeheartedly welcome um, um, Dr. Lajadevi Goel, who is uh, Dean uh, Research, who always inspires us 
to uh, uh, organize such kind of academic activities. I am profoundly delighted to take an opportunity to uh, invite uh, the chairpersons of this uh, CME, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Mitra, uh, who is the professor and head uh, at uh, AMZ Rishikesh, and Dr. Ramandeep Singh, who is professor in PJMEA Chandigarh, who have joined us today to share their knowledge and vast experience. I am also um, welcoming our eminent speakers, Dr. Munish Dhawan, who is HOD uh, GMC uh, Faridkot, Dr. Amit Raj, who is additional professor and head at uh, AIMS Patna. Dr. Anupam, who is additional professor uh, in AIMS Rishikesh. They have uh, joined us uh, by taking their precious time out of their tight schedules. I'm really thankful and I'm just, uh, I'm welcoming you all. I would like to welcome all the participants who have joined us for this um, CME on this virtual space. I heartily welcome uh, my dear colleagues, Dr. Sanjeev, for his cooperation. I welcome my uh, senior resident, Dr. Lavi Mangla and Dr. Sushant, who has uh, made a lot of efforts to make this CME a success. I would like to um, welcome our postgraduate students and nursing students and our uh, non-teaching staff who have cooperated us for preparation of this event. Last but not the least, I welcome all the faculty members of other department of uh, AIMS Bhatinda who have joined here uh, for this CMA today. Today we are gather, gathered here for uh, on the uh, virtual platform for active and interactive learning on all the aspects of topic site threatening ocular infections. This CMA is conducted on digital platform because of the social distancing norm uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the galaxy of ophthalmologists will be enlightening us with their experiences and opinion as every ophthalmologist is scared of um, ocular infections because if not treated well in time, these can lead to devastating outcome of blindness and even ocular deformities. It is not a theory topic, but it is a topic of uh, ophthalmic emergency, which every ophthalmologist come across in their lifetime. This topic will be covered in anatomical hierarchy starting from orbit going to the retina and this topic uh, like uh, antibiotic sensitivity and OT uh, uh, control in, uh, infection control will be of immense importance and giving us uh, important uh, practical tips. So now uh, to begin with this auspicious event we would like to pay tribute to Ma Saraswati, goddess of uh, um, knowledge and wisdom with the customary Saraswati Vanda. Thank you. To invite our chief guest, our director, sir. Uh, he'll be sharing his uh, visionary thoughts along with us and uh, for a few uh, motivational words. Over to you, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Nrada, if I'm audible properly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, I congratulate you for organizing this very important discussion on a very important topic. Professor Satish Gupta, the Dean of uh, AIMS, Batinda. I can see Raman Deep Singh, the professor of Talmix, Dr. Mittal from Rishikes, Dr. Dhaman, and other faculty joining as a resource person, as a participant. I welcome you all on behalf of myself and M. Subhatinda. I again congratulate the Department of Talmix for organizing this symposium. We all know that eye is the most important part of the body. And out of that, the surface is also, among that is the most important. I myself is a sufferer of this problem. I have uh, contacted Professor Sangwan in Hyderabad and sometimes in uh, Delhi RP Center because of the ocular surface problem. I feel that uh, this is a very important topic because of the increasing pollution. My problem when I was in Ranchi, it was less because the Ranchi was less polluted. Before that, I was residing in Varanasi. Now I am in Vadinda. The pollution level of Varanasi and uh, Vadinda is high. So that the reason now I am also suffering this burning problem and sometimes the other problem of, of I. Uh, because, maybe because of the pollution. So you need to deliver uh, how to prevent effect of the pollution on the ocular surface disorders. The second thing we all 
like we are meeting over the computer we are using more screen time it has tremendously increased the screening screen time of mobile or tv or computer so that is also affecting our eyes even the small children they are getting problem so i hope that uh, the ophthalmics those who are attending the symposium will deliberate upon it and will recommend certain preventive things to the society to the school children to the other users of the computer mobile tv and uh, even we can't uh, reduce the pollution but certainly we can recommend how to prevent yourself because uh, of the ocular surface problem because of the increasing pollution so with this i again um, welcome and congratulate the department i tell mix for organizing this important topic i hope uh, this will give good recommendation and uh, will definitely uh, will be a learning point for the residents doctor if they are attending pg doctors and the new doctors those who will be benefited by the opinion of the senior ophthalmologist like dr raman deep singh dr mittal and other faculty member i again wish all the good luck and uh, all good for the symposium thank you thank you sir for your words of wisdom uh, no i <clears throat> i would like to uh, introduce uh, the two persons of uh, today's cme uh, first of all uh, i'll be introducing uh, uh, dr sanjeev kumar mittal he is a professor and head in um, rishikesh uh, with profound delight sir i welcome you uh, he is uh, he has done his mbbs from gsv and uh, medical college kanpur and ms from the same institute and uh, he is a fellow of in, um, international council of ophthalmology um, ganma university uh, japan and he is a member of uh, uh, medical uh, that uh, he is a member of uh, so uh, this is a national academy of uh, medical sciences so he has teaching experience of 26 years with 17 years of experience as professor he is a, a md ms teacher and examiner since 2003 and uh, mbbs examiner since 2001 the specialties uh, and his expertise are in cataract glaucoma comprehensive ophthalmology and community ophthalmology so uh, he has done various trainings and uh, fellowships in arvind arvind uh, one of that is arvind uh, in arvind eye hospital on uh, microsurgery iol sics eye hospital and manpower management and he has done uh, some uh, some training on uh, eye banking in 2000 and uh, retinal lasers in 2003 in lvpi hospital uh, hyderabad and he has done uh, um, that uh, fellowship in feco uh, 2011 in narayan natralya he has done um, fellowship in uh, cmc ludhiana aims delhi and manipal uh, universities for that medical education and training courses various training courses he has um uh, joined uh, and uh, he has also done a fellowship in contact lenses in gandhi eye hospital aligarh so he has completed uh, 16 uh, research projects and his research publications in various index and um, index journals is uh, 72 and he has uh, supervised 34 uh, theses uh, he has a chapter in one book and he has co-authored one uh, book and he has organized three state level conferences and various cmes and training courses since uh, 2000 thank you sir and we welcome you here on this platform and now i would like to uh, introduce our uh, another chair person he is uh, dr ramandeep singh he is uh, currently working as a professor at uh, um, advanced eye center in uh, sub specialty of vitreo retina and uvea at post graduate institute of medical education and research chandigarh Uh, since uh, 2017 he is uh, working as professor there he has received uh, medical mbbs uh, degree from govan medical college patiala punjab and he joined his post graduation in ophthalmology at pgi chandigarh in uh, 1998 he has complete uh, during his post graduation uh, he did thesis on hiv and ocular manifestation under the um, observership of uh, professor uh, mangatram dogra after his residency he has done the senior residency in a special field of vitreo retina and uveitis uh, and um, he has uh, also joined as uh, he joined as assistant professor in the same department pgimer chandigarh since uh, 2006 and his main area of interest are diabetes age related macular degeneration retinal surgeries retinal imaging and intraocular infections especially hiv he was uh, he was instrumental in starting his first super specialty program in ophthalmology 
in any government institute mch in vitro retina and a three year course in india uh, with the um, under the mentorship of uh, professor uh, amod gupta and professor mangalram rogda sir so he has more than 180 publication in various national and international index journals and he has contributed more than 200 lectures in various national and international conferences he has also co-authored a book on diabetic retinopathy and authored 12 chapter in various books he has authored one video surgical book he got the most pre prestigious jm pahav award by vitu retina society of india in 2007 he is a scientific reviewer for various uh, major national and international journal and uh, above all he is uh, married to a cornea surgeon who is also my colleague my batchmate of uh, mbbs and uh, he is blessed with a daughter and son thank you sir for joining us we are obliged over to uh, you dr lavi uh, for the introduction of dr anupam she will be starting thank you dr anupam thank for being with us thank you ma'am okay so let's start with today's virtual cme session uh, our first speaker is dr anupam she is currently working as additional professor uh, uh, of ophthalmology at aims rishikesh she has done her masters and senior residency from mc new delhi uh, her area of interest are pediatric ophthalmology strabismus and oculoplasty she has more than 80 uh, index national and international publications to her name and has chaired many scientific sessions in many state and national conferences So, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Anupam to deliver talk on uh, orbital infections and update. Please, ma'am, over to you. At the out outset, thank you, Dr. Lavi. At the out outset, I would like to thank Dr. Anuradha and uh, all the whole organizing team to uh, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, is my slide visible? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Okay. so the first topic i which is very important one I, I, among the side threatening or uh, ocular infection is orbital infection and uh, we start with orbital cellulitis as we all know orbital cellulitis is inflammation of orbital tissues behind the orbital septum it is a acute spread of infection into the eye socket from either adjacent sinuses or to blood from distal places and it, if it affects the rear end of the eye it can also be it formed uh, as red to orbital cellulitis uh orbital cellulitis per se is more uh, common in pediatric population and males and it is its incidence is more in uh, pediatric population that is 1.6 per 1 lakh pediatric population and 0.1 per 1 lakh adult population and as far as seasonal recurrence is concerned it is more common in late winters and early spring that today's time and this time is more uh, common for adult cellulitis by because at this time respiratory infections are more common then coming to etiology as we have already discussed because uh, cellulitis uh, can be uh, lead, uh, can be due to extension of infection from neighboring structure and the most important neighboring structure is paranasal sinuses followed by teeth face lips internal cavity and intraorbital structures Exogenous infection can also lead to cell cellulitis in the form of foreign body and penetrating injury, insect bite, or surgery. Endogenous infections can also uh, travel to orbit, and the most common one is upper respiratory tract infection, peripheral sepsis, thrombophlebitis from leg, and septicemia. When we come to agents, bacteria, fungi, and parasites are responsible can be responsible for cellulitis. Among bacteria, the children. Uh, are affected more by staph aureus streptococcus pneumoniae and anaerobes in adults staph aureus and pneumonia are more common followed by e coli and nexflora aspergillus and mucor are more common uh, fungal agents and among parasites echinococcus granulosus tinea solium trichinella spiralis and toxoplasma fungi are the most common organisms sandler's cl classified this cellulitis into five groups preseptal cellulitis orbital cellulitis subperiosteal abscess orbital abscess and cavernous sinus thrombosis uh, jn and rubin uh, simplified this classification and they classified into three uh, types preseptal cellulitis orbital cellulitis with or without intracranial complication and orbital abscess with or without intracranial complications but the most common uh, one which is being discussed is sandler's so we will be discussing the sandler's one preseptal the term itself suggests the infection is anterior to the orbital septum and it presents only with edema of the lid eyelids are swollen and non tender and the rest of the manifestation manifestation of cellulitis is not seen like congenital 
osmosis, extraocular muscle movements are normal, and uh, no pupillary or visual impairment. No pupillary are normal or visual impairment is seen. In orbital cellulitis, the infection spread beyond the orbital septum. So the patient may present with pronounced edema and inflammation of the orbital content, but without abscess formation. And the signs of proptosis and reduced ocular motility can be seen, and which is the reliable sign of orbital cellulitis. Loss of vision is also rare, but vision should always be constantly monitored in these patients. The third one is subperiosteal abscess. The term itself suggests that the, there is abscess or accumulation of edutates and pus between the periosteum and bone. And the most common uh, wall of orbit which is uh, involved in subperiosteal abscess is medial and inferior. Medial wall is in close proximity with the ethmoid sinus, and inferior wall is more close to proximity with the maxillary sinus and both these walls are thin and relatively more permeable to infections. So in that case, uh, the patient, patient will present with signs of uh, congenital chemosis and the orbital contents may be displaced due to mass effect of the community plus. And chemosis and proptosis is usually present. Decrease ocular mobility and loss of vision is also rare in this group. This is a clinical picture of a patient having medial subperiosteal abscess along due to the pre-existing ethmoid sinusitis. Then we come to next one, which is orbital abscess. The orbital abscess is usually involves collection of prolonged material within the orbital content. And this could be due to relentless progression of the cellulitis if not managed at the early stage or rupture of any subperiosteal abscess. And these patients present with severe proptosis complete ophthalmoplegia and loss of vision are common in this way. This is the case of orbital abscess, which presented with external ophthalmoplegia and further patient was uh, in on neuroimaging, there was involvement of brain and brain abscess was there. So on uh, the fifth one and which is the most uh, light threatening and side threatening one is cavernous sinus thrombosis. And in this stage, patient develops usually bilateral ocular signs with features of headache, fever, photophobia, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and loss of vision. As cavernous sinus is traversed by various vital structure, the various neurological and cranial palsies are seen. Neurological signs and cranial palsies can be seen in this patient, these kind of patients. The other signs of uh, orbital cellulitis per se, as we have already discussed, congenital chemosis can be there along with proptosis due to mass effect, external ophthalmoplegia because of orbital abscess or cavernous sinus involvement. On posterior segment involvement, there can be optic neuropathy and papadema. A central retinal artery or venous occlusion can be seen because of ischemia. In severe cases, if patient not, um, is not properly managed at early stage, patient can, lead to, uh, can progress to endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis. So what are the differentials? There are various conditions which mimic uh, like orbital cellulitis and we have to cautious, uh, cautiously label these patients to orbital cellulitis and those conditions are primary neoplasm, especially retinoblastoma and retinoblastoma sarcomas, leukemias, lymphomas, hemangiomas and various secondaries from other tumors. Retained foreign body is one of the very important cause, uh, condition which can mimic like orbital cellulitis. Giant cell arthritis span, uh, carotid cavernous facial may be post-traumatic or, or uh, pre-existing pseudo tumor syndromes and thyroid ophthalmopathy can also mimic like the current uh, orbital cellulitis. Uh, here, I would like to discuss a case which presented to us with clinical sign of preceptal cellulitis with chronic discharge of pus. And there was history of trauma with a wooden stick few months back, maybe 10 months back. On, and patient was subjected to oral antibiotic, but patient did not respond. When we were subjected to neural imaging, there was of evidence of foreign body along with inflammatory changes involving extraocular muscles. Patient was uh, patient underwent a surgical exploration and a nine millimeter long wooden foreign body was taken out and patient was symptoms were relieved. This is another case of cavernous hemangioma, hemangioma which presented with all signs of uh, orbital cellulitis with late swelling, outward protrusion of the eyeball, chemosis and on. And patient was started on empirical antibiotic therapy, but she didn't respond. And on neuroimaging, there was a retrobulbar mass. On MRA, there was evidence of uh, vascular mass and patient was subjected to surgery and reconstruction and patient recovered well. So we have to be very cautious about uh, before labeling any patient to orbital cellulitis. And before we label it, patient should undergo 
a battery of investigations, including complete hemogram, bacterial culture, nasal swabs, and imaging in the form of X-ray PNS, ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI. Ultrasound per se is not very helpful in diagnosis and of orbital cellulitis, but it rules out orbital myositis. It can it determines foreign bodies and abscesses, and it is important in follow-up patients of drain abscesses. CT scan is in the investigation of choice, first investigation of choice as far as orbital cellulitis is concerned. And the more important views are axial and coronal views. Axial view is important to rule out any intracranial extension of infection, and coronal views are important to rule out any subperiosteal abscess. And it also tells us about the extent of sinus disease, any osteomyelitis, thickening of optic, optic nerve, and any intracranial or extracranial mass. MRI with the uh, granulinium contrast enhancement is investigation of choice in case we are planning to do surgery and in case we are evaluating a patient on follow-up visit because a patient cannot be subjected to multiple CT scan because of risk of exposure to radiation. And it is superior to CT, CT in cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis and brain abscesses. So when we come to management of orbital cellulitis, consists of broad spectrum IV antibiotics followed by symptomatic management by analgesic, antibiotics, and anti-inflammatory agents. And if patient doesn't respond to uh, medical management, the indications of surgical drainage are if patient is more than nine years of age. Why nine years of age? Because it is seen over the various study by in various studies that oh, after nine years of age, patients have more prone to have mixed infection and anaerobic infection, which is less responsive to IV medical management and IV antibiotics. Then presence of large subperiosteal abscesses, any presence of frontal sinusitis non-medial subperiosteal abscess and suspicion of anaerobic subperiosteal abscess, patient should be subjected to surgical drainage. In case patient develops recurrent subperiosteal abscess after drainage, the chronic sinusitis and dental infection should be ruled out. If patient of abdominal cellulitis is not managed properly at time, it can lead to various complications due to absence of lymphatic system, the infection is spread to the adjacent structures, and due to tight compartments, the intraorbital pressure is raised and it augments the virulence of infection by causing necrosis and sloughing. The complication can be side threatening and life threatening. Among the side threatening com complications are central retinal artery occlusion and vein occlusion, exposure carried to within optic atrophy because of the mass effect, septic optic neuritis, thromboembolic lesions of the retina, choroid, and optic nerve, and life threatening infections are cavernous sinus thrombosis, meningitis brain axis and septicemia. And the most important one is cavernous sinus thrombosis. The cavernous sinus is nothing but, as we all know, particular cavernous space created by layers of dura matter and filled with venous blood. This blood drains the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein anteriorly and posteriorly it further drains into basilar plexus through inferior and superior petrosal sinuses and these connexes are wireless free so if infection is not controlled in the orbit the infection will uh, travel travel to the uh, cavernous sinus and the cavernous sinus is freely connected to the other side as well so the infection can easily spread to brain and and the other side as well and the mechanism of spread is embolization of bacteria then valveless communication and communication between the right and left cavernous sinuses. As we have all know, cavernous sinus is traversed with various vital structures, the internal carotid artery with, along with sympathetic plexus, fifth, a sixth cannula with the center, and in the lateral wall there is third nerve, fourth nerve, and first and second division of the fifth nerve. So once cavernous sinus thrombosis develops, the patient will develop symptoms according to uh, effect, effect of these, uh, these nerves, involvement of these vital structures. So local compression and inflammation of the cranial nerve can lead to diplopia from partial or complete, due to partial or complete external ophthalmoplegia. Patient can have internal ophthalmoplegia. Patient can have numbness and paresthesia along the uh, supply of fifth cranial nerve. And the infection can spread to dural sinuses, cerebrum and emissary vein can, uh, can be uh, involved leading to meningitis, dural lymphoma and brain abscess. So once the infection goes to brain, the patient can be asymptomatic 
it's not hard and fast rule in the patient will develop symptom we have to be very cautious and patient should be subjected to neuroimaging if patient doesn't respond to medical medical uh, management and in some patient uh, patient uh, the manifestation can be fever nausea vomiting seizure and change of mental status not only brain even infection can is peptic emboli abscess pneumonia and lymphoma even stroke can occur due to involvement of carotid artery narrowing vasculitis and hemorrhagic infarction and when we come to treatment of complication the treatment is more or less the same that is intravenous a uh, broad spectrum and antibiotics antifungals if a fungal agent is suspected and surgical intervention depending upon the location of the abscess so at the end i would like to discuss the treatment algorithm of orbitalis if patient present to ophthalmology opt the management depends upon the orbital sign if there is no orbital sign then patient is labeled patient should be labeled as preceptal cellulitis and medical should be medically managed if orbital signs are present the patient should be admitted and subjected to medical management and neuroimaging if there is no signs of uh, uh, surgical uh, drainage and indication of surgical drainage on neuro neuroimaging then patient should continue with medical management that consists of iv antibiotic broad spectrum mostly third generation cephalosporin fluoxetine or augmentin nasal hygiene and various culture and blood investigations if patient improves clinically patient can continue with the same treatment if does not improve and worsen patient should be subjected to repeat neuro imaging and metronidazole or trendamycin can be added if there is indication of surgical drainage then patient should be managed both surgically and medically so to conclude early diagnosis and management are crucial to prevent site and life threatening complication of orbital cellulitis comprehension of clinical manifestation predisposing factors microbiology and management of disease is utmost important for favorable outcome a multidisciplinary approach is indispensable for responsible monitoring and management of the disease and future studies may also help to better define prognostic criteria based on imaging to stratify risk and identify cases that require early surgical intervention these are my references and most of the figures i Uh, presented in my presentation was taken from my own uh, patients, and except one, uh, which was taken from an article. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Anupam, ma'am. Uh, it was a very wonderful talk covering every aspect of orbital infections. Uh, so moving on uh, our next topic for discussion is corneal perforation and uh, its management by Dr. Anuradha Raj she is currently working as additional professor uh, and the head of department in aims batenda uh, she has done her post graduation from gmc amritsar and senior residency from pgi chandigarh with vast experience of teaching experience of 12 years she has more than uh, 75 publications to her name in various index journals with multiple research projects which has already been completed and uh, uh, with multi and multiple research projects are currently ongoing under her she has special interest and experience in cornea eye banking glaucoma ocular and ocular surface disease uh, she has also written two books uh, oct in penetrating keratoplasty a boon by scholar press publications and another one uh, is uh, penetrating keratoplasty is still a gold standard by cambridge Scho uh, scholar press publications uk Uh, she is on editorial board of various journals, uh, and she is also a reviewer in uh, numerous international journals. So, uh, ma'am, uh, I invite you to deliver your talk on corneal perforation and its management. Please, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lavish, uh, for this nice introduction. Sure. So, uh, I have shared my screen. Is it visible? Is it? No, ma'am. Okay, just hold. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So, uh, the topic of my discussion uh, today is corneal perforations and their management. Uh, all the cases which I will be showing will uh, were managed by uh, me in, at the previous institute. 
So this is my disclaimer. So uh, I'll be starting uh, with this. Uh, first of all, infective keratitis. Whenever it happens, epithelial integrity uh, always get uh, compromised and stromal melting and lysis takes place, which leads to breach in the desmet membrane. And desmet membrane is the thickest, uh, is a membrane which uh, doesn't allow these microorganisms inside the eye, inside the um, anterior chamber. So desmet membrane, it, it herniates uh, due to insert and as it, it um, herniates as a transparent vesicle, which is known as desmetocin or keratocin. This is the sign of impending perforation. But sudden stress due to cough, sneeze or spasm of the orbicularis muscle can lead to impending perforation, uh, convert this impending perforation to actual perforation. So con corneal perforation is an act uh, ocular emergency because it leads to risk of microbial entry uh, into the eye. And uh, due to leakage of the aqueous from the anterior chamber, hypotony is uh, resulted, which uh, further lead to uh, macular pathologies. It also leads to flat, flat anterior chamber because of leakage of aqueous and peripheral anterior sinicae formation and eventually glaucoma, which is side threatening. So various predisposing factors for this uh, entity are extrinsic, that is due to trauma, and intrinsic that is due to abnormality in the corneal collagen, like in cases of keratoconus, in cases of pellucid marginal degenerations, mural ulcers, and there are other conditions which interfere with the ocular surface defense. Whenever there is a dry eye or uh, something uh, related to ocular surface defense. So various uh, causes of corneal perforations are infectious. Uh, the infections can be due to bacteria, viral or fungal. In cases of bacterial infections, there are excessive uh, polymorphonuclear cells which leads to the uh, formation of various uh, collagenases, which leads to stromal melt and further corneal perforations. Then non-infectious uh, pathologies are uh, related to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, SLE, Wegener granulomatosis, uh, polyarthritis nodosa, sarcoidosis, and Muran's ulcer. Traumatic can be due to penetrating injury or chemical injury. Due to chemical injury, there can be stromal melt and further it can lead on to um, this uh, entity. So various signs and symptoms are desmetocele is the um, impending perforation. Here we can see the desmet folds at the um, base of the ulcer and central zone which come out as a very thin area of uh, like a vesicle. So uh, then when there is a perforation, uveal prolapse can be seen and positive serial test with a stream of um, fluid, uh, stream of fluid from the uh, anterior chamber, and which can be seen as a um, diluted um, fluorescent stain. Then flat anterior chamber is also one of the sign of perforation. Various symptoms: patient comes to us with a sudden drop in visual acuity and ocular pain, uh, and uh, decreased IOP. And sometimes patient can uh, tell us about that that patient uh, experienced some kind of warm fluid came out of the eye. So these are various presentations um, of uh, different kind of uh, perforations. This is a patient with the complete uh, collapsed anterior chamber, and uh, uh, it is having. And that's this was a phakic patient, and this is a vitreous uh, um, uh, wick which is seen through this perforation. This is a perforation showing this iris, and it is coming out of it, and pupillary margin is dragged towards that side. This uh, perforation is showing uh, this crystalline lens uh, which is popping out of the central perforation. This is a desmetocin and this is a case, case uh, which was a very interesting case and this uh, case came to me in the OPD and uh, here a uh, crystalline lens when I did uh, TPK for this case crystalline lens was not visible. Uh, it popped out uh, uh, at the patient level only and this was all vitreous weak and patient was faking when he presented to us and when we, uh, we explored this on the OT table. So lab diagnosis, uh, it depends upon uh, the site of perforation, site of thinning, and if there is actual thinning, we cannot take uh, these uh, um, for these samples for gram stain or KOH because uh, ultimately we have to uh, do some surgical intervention in these cases. But if there is no associated thinning, we can take uh, these corneal scrapings from the margins of the ulcer for gram stain and QH stain. Then uh, culture can be done uh, with blood agar for aerobic bacteria and fungi, and then a chocolate agar can be used for anaerobes, uh, aerobes and Neisseria group. Then SG medium can be used for uh, fungi, and uh, uh, calcofluor white can be used for acanthamoeba. Drug sensitivity is also very much important in those cases who are uh, refractory to the treatment and who are not responding to the empirical treatment on which the patient was put on. So B scan is a um, very much important investigation. It helps us to find out uh, the prognosis and even to decide the 
uh, treatment strategy. B scan is done to rule out endophthalmitis uh, to find out the uh, status of the lens to find out whether there is retinal detachment or maybe there is a thigh skull whereby if long standing um, a perforation is there it can lead to that also and we can also rule out panophthalmitis so in those uh, all these cases the management will be different and it has been um, by one article it has uh, been reported that 44 percent of cases uh, in whom there was a perforation more than two millimeter led to choroidal detachment so this is a choroidal detachment and this is a one of my patient who came to us with panophthalmitis it is showing a uh, very blurry but uh, t sign visible along with multiple uh, choroids uh, the, the choroidal detachment as well as retinal detachment and exudate so this is a case of panophthalmitis so various principle of management are to provide the stromal support because uh, collagen lysis is there and corneal thinning is also there so stromal support has to be provided for this management we need to form the ac uh, to maintain the integrity anatomical integrity of the globe and to uh, heal the wound to prevent the secondary infection at all the um, time of the um, follow-up of these cases and to address the cause if the cause is not addressed that um, job is half done so to manage these cases it depends upon the size of perforation if it is less than 2.5 tissue adhesive will um, play an important role if it is more than uh, it is 5 millimeter or more than 5 millimeter patch graft will be depending upon the location and more than 5 millimeter tectonic or tpk can be done Location is also very much important. Central location, we can take 4 to 5 millimeter, paracentral 5 to 8 millimeter, and peripheral are um, uh, more than 8 millimeter. For that, uh, we can do tenonplasty or patch graft in peripheral uh, kind of uh, perforations. Stromal depth is also very much important. Uh, if these are superficial, then C3 can be done, but not for perforation. It is only for effective keratitis. For deep, we can do uh, DALCAN for full thickness, PK can be done. It also depends upon the cause, visual status, and infiltrates. In cases of trauma, we can do suturing, and in cases of endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis, the treatment will differ. So, uh, non-surgical management is to uh, treat the infections with antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and anticollagenesis because they prevent uh, the stromal melting. And anti-inflammatory uh, should be used along with an anti glaucoma because at, at all the time, we need to uh, reduce the pressure. And then for surgical management, tissue adhesive can be done for smaller perforation, amniotic membrane transplant, we can suture in cases of uh, those injuries uh, cases and conjunctival flaps if we don't have any kind of uh, backup with the cornea. So tissue adhesive, uh, cyanocrylate glue uh, can be used, it is a bacteriostatic and it long lasts than the uh, fibrin uh, glue and it inhibits polymorphonuclear cells and production of collagenases. It is uh, best for uh, perforations which are less than 3 mm in size and uh, uh, even concave and in, uh, that concave uh, perforations, uh, they behave very well. If they are uh, deep uh, perforations with the iris prolapse, double patch, tectonic uh, patch can be done with the uh, simple drape sheet along with the cyanocrylate glue. So how to apply glue? Uh, we have to debride the necrotic tissue from the greater epithelial debridement to uh, so that it can adhere to the basement membrane. We have to dry that site with the wipes for the proper adherence of uh, the glue. And we need to apply in a very small quantity. Otherwise, it will uh, hurt the patient and it can lead to various other uh, problems. We have to wait till it solidifies, polymerize, and then we need to check the interior chamber. If an uh, interior chamber is not formed and the iris is plugging that, we need to form the interior chamber from the side port. And in the end, we need to uh, provide the PCL. We can keep this glue for four to eight weeks and longer, uh, we need to provide it for longer time in larger perforation and in cases of neurotrophic corneas. We need to recognize uh, all the causes before it is uh, removed, uh, infection uh, will be controlled and whenever it is loosely um, attached, only then it should be removed. If it is not loose, then we should not remove. It means that it is not healed, that underneath cornea is not healed properly. So these are the uh, case scenarios. Uh, this is a case with showing this iris prolapse through this area. And this is after glue uh, application. This is also showing the desmetoseal with a lot of infiltrates, that bad looking cornea along with the hypopion. And this is the same case after putting this glue and hypopion has gone and infiltrates have resolved completely. So these are another uh, few cases with this uh, kind of pictures, pre-op and post-op. This is a dismetoseal 
and uh, this is a post flu and this is a very interesting case this was 17 years old child who came to our opd with the uh, injury with the bristle of the toothbrush when he was uh, brushing his teeth and uh, it was a perforation very small perforation with cedar positive and uh, here uh, cyanocrylate glue was applied to it and uh, it healed with a uh, nebulomacular macular opacity so tarsurafi can um, be also one of the answer for uh, this but uh, not uh, in isolation in as an adjunct to other kind of uh, therapies if we are putting amniotic membrane or just like that in case uh, cases the perforation if they are larger in size they are involving the peripheral con uh, that the peripheral limbus also then sclerocleratoplasty can be done Conjunctival flap can be done in cases of non-healing ulcers and to avoid these perforations we can put the conjunctiva we can take conjunctiva from the periphery and it can be pulled over the affected cornea. It promotes the healing by bringing all these growth of the superficial vessels. But it is not to be done in cases of active superative keratitis and marked stomal thinning with, with frank perforations. Because if there are frank perforation and this conjunctiva is there, we cannot find out what is going uh, beneath that. Amniotic membrane transplant uh, is a very good option for these kind of perforation. We can restore the corneal stroma thickness as a scaffold for the epithelial growth and incorporation of the stroma. A single layer overlay in layer technique can be done or multi-layer amniotic membrane or Swiss roll can be secured over the perforation with either sutures or glue. So it is composed of a single layer of epithelial cells, a basement membrane and a layer of uh, avascular stroma. It is a very rich source of fibroblastic growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor, and transforming growth factor beta. It promotes tissue repair and remodeling, helps in epithelial healing, and reduces the inflammation, aspiration, and further uh, scarring. This is a patient uh, with having such kind of infiltrates, post keratoplasty, and uh, here uh, we can see that uh, amniotic membrane has been uh, put on this, and now it has uh, dissolved, and this uh, see this kind of graft, and now this has healed, and the graft has again shined out and this, these are the sutures which can be which were removed later on so amniotic membrane is very effective uh, entity for larger perforations for peripheral perforation and also for aqueous diffusion disorders because it always uh, gives the nutrition to the ocular surface so it provides a tectonic stability and quicker healing this is a patient of mine who was Steven, uh, case of Steven Johnson syndrome. For that, we uh, did. Uh, he uh, he came to us with a total opaque cornea with such kind of uh, um, vascularized scar, but uh, vascularization afterwards increased and it did led to epithelial defect. And later on, uh, epithelial defect increased and from graft host to graft host junction, uh, it molten away. So this was the further status. And in that case, because uh, repeat graft in these cases lead to again uh, that uh, kind of uh, graft failure. So in that case, we did uh, this uh, amniotic membrane transplant. It was multi-layered and it was sutured uh, here. And this uh, graft, it could revive. So it is uh, amniotic membrane uh, grafting. It is not indicated in cases of infective cases because it interfere with the penetration of drugs. If we are uh, putting so many layers and we are putting the drugs, corneal uh, of, uh, that uh, penetration of the drug will be uh, jeopardized. So penetrating keratoplasty is the another option uh, when uh, all other options are gone away. Then uh, this is the option for larger corneal perforation, more than four millimeter in size, flat interior chamber is there, you will prolapse is there, and patient is not responding to any kind of treatment. In cases of infective keratitis, it is prudent to delay the PK until aggressive uh, fortified antibiotics have been started 24 to 48 hours because it can lead to um, other kind of infections like endothelmitis or even sclera can be involved. So we, uh, this is these are the photographs just to um, tell various steps of the uh, therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. This is a, um, I have put a trephine over that area of uh, infective uh, keratitis uh, that uh, um, uh, cornea. So here we have to take one to 1.5 millimeter of the normal cornea in the trephination um, zone and then it should be uh, cut and then here we, it is a very much important step to remove all these, um, this kind of a fibrin from the angles so that recurrence will not be there. Then orientation of the graph, and then these are the four uh, cardinal sutures which, which were applied, and then uh, inter, um, that interrupted sutures are applied for this case. So this is just to show various steps of TPK. 
So uh, this is uh, one of the case uh, he presented to us with this kind of picture and it was nothing was visible in the interior chamber and uh, for that therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty was done uh, with the uh, glycerol preserved cornea. It was very shiny um, on the next uh, post of day but after two months this uh, graft gave way and it became opaque and uh, when this graft was sent, this um, button was sent for histopathology it came out to be fusarium. This is the case uh, which I have shown earlier also. This uh, uh, case come, came to us with the vitreous uh, popping out from this uh, area and uh, lens was not visible when uh, on the table and it wa uh, was a fake one. And then uh, this graft was sent for histopathology uh, which again showed us that uh, curvul area um, growth was seen. So this was post-operative. This is the picture of that case. And these both cases was, uh, were asperigilous and the TPK was done for these cases and they gave very good result for that. So these are another cases where bad looking corneas, limbus to limbus with so much of vascularization, but TPK was done in these cases. This was almost whole melt and uh, limbus to limbus melt with the sclera involving, but TPK was done along with some kind of sclerocleotoplasty. So corneal patch graft is the answer for te uh, tectonic grafting for peripheral corneal perforations. Uh, because uh, if peripheral corneal perforation is there, we can uh, uh, provide uh, the graft on that area only. So this is one of my cases where we did a tectonic patch graft and this is a suture. And in this case, we used that glycerin preserved cornea to maintain the integrity of the globe. So, uh, laminar keratoplasty is uh, the tectonic means to patch the cornea in cases of corneal perforation and desmetosil. It is preferred over PK because of immunological re uh, rejection and endothelial decompensation. Tectonic uh, DEL can also be done in uh, for these cases of uh, keratitis. It depends upon the depth and severity of the corneal pathology. By using big bubble or a manual LK, it can be performed successfully. Crescentric LK can be done uh, for the perforations uh, with palisade marginal degeneration, but this is one of, my, one of my case. It was a limbal dermoid and on OCT, um, uh, anterior segment OCT, it was found that it was almost touching the uh, desmet membrane. So it was quite deep. So in that case, uh, we did that uh, uh, crescentric LK and this is post-operatively. So there, uh, a lesser risk of graft rejection is there because endothelium belongs to the patient uh, own one and uh, peripheral anterior sneaky formation is also not there and glaucoma is also not seen in such cases because uh, the integrity of the angle is uh, maintained. Tectonic epicatoplasty can be done uh, if it is a bad melt of the cornea. In this case, a glycerol preserved uh, button can be used to seal the perforation. Uh, but it is a temporary procedure. It needs a subsequent PK. So graft is just a suture over the recipient sclera uh, upon the molten cornea with the uh, peritomy of 360 degree. So various complications of perforation are increased IOP because everything, so much inflammation is there and uh, angles are already closed with this uh, kind of uh, fibrin material. Corneal fistula formation can be there and after healing, they lead to adherent leukoma formation. And if uh, they are healing, sometimes they heal with the anterior staphyloma. Cataract can be one of the complications and those uh, disastrous complications can be end of the mitis. When we are just treating with the corneal perforation, but we are landing up with the end of the mitis or pan of the mitis if uh, the sclera is involved. So this is one of my case for which OPK was done, but he was very badly controlled diabetic and he came to us uh, after two or three days of OPK with this kind of picture with pan of thermitis. And after that, uh, because he was having very um, uh, bad um, glycemic controls. So outcome and prognosis, it depends upon the etiology site and size of the perforation. TPK is done for the infectious condition and it carry a better prognosis, both in terms of visual gain and graft survival. The functional uh, results is often secondary to the anatomical disorders. Visual out outcome is not the primary aim, but a stable watertight ocular surface is the first goal. Outcome is more predictive with the ocular surface and active infection and inflammation leads to uh, poor outcome in these cases. This is one of my publication in uh, Journal of Current Ophthalmology, Outcome of Therapeutic Penetrating Keratoplasty in Advanced Infectious Keratitis. In this uh, um, publication, uh, we uh, reported that perforated corneal ulcer was a major indication for TPK, almost 55% 
of the cases but in this in those cases anatomical success could be retrieved for 86 percent of cases and therapeutic success was seen in eight, uh, nine, uh, almost 90 percent of cases and functional success means the visual outcome was good in these cases about 70 percent so indications and complications was significantly affecting the anatomical therapeutic and functional outcome in our case series so take home messages no one size fits all approach is always challenging and unpredictable whatever we are doing we cannot predict the outcome but it also depends upon few signs which we can foresee when there is no donor cornea amniotic membrane and conjunctival flaps they are very good options the size location and etiology all contribute to the visual equity inferior in cases of infective keratitis always start treating the infection 48 hours before to avoid the complication otherwise severity of infection and growth uh, integrity can be insulted medical and uh, uh, surgical treatment can be successful after uh, system uh, systematic uh, systemic exclusion although small perforations respond well to uh, tissue travel flaps large perforations and those who are not responsive to other measures may need urgent penetrating keratoplast thank you Thank you, Dr. Nurada. It's a nice uh, talk by you and Dr. Anupam, the first talk by Dr. Anupam. And uh, you had given all complete information. We invite questions from the audience online. The other colleagues, if they have some questions, they can put up the question for the first talk by Dr. Anupam and uh, by Dr. Nurada in this, if there are some questions. We can see in the chat box. Or some, or they can just uh, type it in the chat box. Uh, send the questions in the chat box. If there are no question, then over to Dr. Lavi. Uh, thank you, sir. So moving on, uh, our next talk is by Dr. Amit, uh, Dr. Amit Raj. He is currently working as additional professor uh, and uh, is heading the Department of Ophthalmology in Ames, Patna. Uh, he has done his master's from uh, BHU. Uh, uh, in the peer reviewed national and international journals. He has also won a Dukhan Ram gold medal by Bihar Ophthalmic Society in 2008 and uh, has received best e poster conference 2013. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Amit sir. He'll be delivering talk on ocular manifestations of mucomycosis. Thank you, Dr. Lavi, for kind of your introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Is my slide visual? No, sir. Just a now it is visual. Now it's visible. Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Thank you. So at the outset, I am thankful to Dr. Anuradha yes. for making me part of this webinar. Uh, as, uh, I was uh, deeply associated with the uh, management of nuclear mycosis in second wave of uh, COVID. So when she has given option to uh, speak on ocular manifestation, I, I readily accepted uh, the topic. So uh, what is mu mucor mycosis? As uh, it was defined by Skype in the uh, Publication a potentially lethal angioinvasive uh, infection predisposed predisposed by diabetes mellitus, corticosteroid and immunosuppressive drugs, primary or secondary immunodeficiency, hematological malignancy and hematological stem cell transplantation, solid organ malignancy and solid organ transplantation, iron overload, etc. So with the advent of second wave of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, again, one of the uh, risk factor was uh, Corona, uh, Delta variant, maybe. 
So uh, first it was uh, described by Paltov in 1885 and uh, after that uh, there were so many cases reported and uh, there was no cure, uh, almost 100% death was uh, certain after uh, this infection and uh, uh, with the uh, invention of uh, Amputracin V, the first cure was reported by Harris in 1955. So, uh, this is uh, mucormycosis is caused by uh, rhizopus fcdia mucor of uh, uh, mucorels uh, order of the gycomyc gycomycetes class. Uh, other uh, uh, organism, uh, uh, other class is entomoph entomophorales. Uh, they cause basically subcutaneous infection, and it is more common in immunocompetent persons. So, what is the uh, spectrum of mucormycosis? It can present as a uh, with cutaneous manifestation or uh, most common uh, rhino orbital uh, cerebral mucormycosis or sinopulmonary mucormycosis. It may present as gastrointestinal uh, intestinal, uh, mucormycosis or disseminated. I will be dealing mainly with the rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis. So, what are what were the predisposing condition for development of uh, mucormycosis? Uh, of course, diabetes, especially with ketoacidosis, was the most important factor that was associated with mucormycosis. Other factors were chronic steroid and uh, immunosuppressant, neutropenia, transplants, uh, advanced malignancy were the other factor. Uh, another important factor was the desperoxamine injection that can uh, contribute to rapid progression of mucormycosis. As uh, these uh, fungus are readily uh, available in our environment and it uh, after inhalation of uh, this uh, sporangia spore, uh, it can cause infection or even by direct inoculation to the nasal mucosa or by uh, any cut to the skin. So after ingestion into the paranasal sinus, uh, it, it can go uh, inferiorly to the palate, it can involve palate or posteriorly it can go to the spinal sinus or laterally through the orbit uh, and cavernous sinus, it can go into the brain. In, uh, there is another route for brain involvement by uh, cribriform palate of the uh, ethmoid sinus and then it involved frontal uh, lobe of the brain. Walden et al, uh, they have uh, basically studied uh, what, is, what was the molecular mechanism of development of uh, mucormycosis. Uh, uh, one of the theory they have proposed that uh, due to hyperglycemia and ketosis, there, is, uh, there was liberation of uh, iron and uh, there, uh, from serum protein and uh, it again it increases the level of ketone body and free iron that uh, affect the immune system uh, during the infection. It lead to enhanced expression of fungal cell surface uh, cottage receptor and that results in the invasion of the endothelium and augmentation of the fungal growth. Uh, during COVID-19 uh, second wave, uh, another uh, a study by Singh A.K. Itar, they had postulated why there was uh, so much of uh, cases of uh, mucormycosis during uh, COVID-19. They proposed uh, due to uh, indiscriminate use of uh, corticosteroid and many patients with uh, pre-existing diabetes. There was acute hyperglycemia and uh, uh, even in, in some cases there was new onset hyperglycemia. Uh, uh, in COVID-19 infection there was increased cytokine release and in, increased interleukin cysts that uh, led to there is up regulation of uh, ferritin synthesis and uh, there was increased level of intracellular free air that lead to uh, increased reactive oxygen uh, species that uh, promote growth of uh, mucor. Another uh, part of this uh, pathogenesis was due to hypoxia, 
lymphoglyan and decreased CD4 uh, con. There was upregulation of endothelial receptor glucose regulated protein 78, and uh, uh, there was increased mucorels adhesion spore coat uh, protein uh, hemologs. Again, that uh, uh, promotes uh, infection. So, uh, NCTC, National Center of Disease Control, come with the uh, what was the uh, probable risk factor during COVID 19 pandemic that led to uh, rush, uh, so much rush of cases of mucormacus. Uh, one of the important factor was the post COVID 19 uh, recovered population, elderly male population, in cases of uh, organ transplant or stem cell transplant or patient with iron overload due to uh, infection due to uh, bone marrow transplantation and therapy with iron chelators and uh, another important factor was uh, immunosuppressive therapy as part of covid-19 treatment so uh, as per previous classification, ROCM was divided, uh, uh, classified as uh, uh, three stages, clinical stage one, clinical stage two, and clinical stage three. In clinical stage one, uh, disease was limited to sinonasal area. In clinical stage two, uh, disease was limited to rhino orbital disease. And in clinical stage three, it was uh, progressed to cerebral disease. Another newer uh, proposed uh, staging system was uh, given by uh, Hunabar et al. In his uh, staging system, uh, disease by ROCM was divided into four stages. In a stage one, uh, there was involvement of nasal mucosa, in which uh, in a stage one A, it was limited to uh, just middle terminate. In a stage two, it was limited to inferior terminate or ostium or of the nasal lacrimal duct. And uh, in a stage 1D, there was bilateral nasal mucosal involvement. In a stage 2, again, there was involvement of paranasal sinus. In a stage 2, F, one sinus. In a stage 2B, two ipsilateral sinus. And in a stage 2D, there was bilateral paranasal sinus involvement. In a stage 3, there was involvement of orbit. Again, in a stage 3A, there was just involvement of medial orbit. And in a stage 3D, there was bilateral orbital involvement. And in a stage four, there was uh, involvement of CNS. First, initially, there was involvement of, uh, in 4A, there was cavernous sinus involvement. And in the most advanced uh, stage in 4D, there was multifocal or diffuse CNS disease. So, uh, it's diff it, it can present as different uh, features. Uh, most important factor in these cases, uh, patient may present with just uh, malaise, uh, headache, uh, or uh, facial pain, especially facial pain uh, unrelated, unrelated to uh, analgesic is one of the important risk factor uh, in these cases. And patient may present with uh, nasal congestion, post-nasal brief, uh, blood tinge or fall smelling discharge there may be sinus tenderness also uh, patient may present to director to ophthalmology department with a different type of presentation uh, like uh, uh, maybe simple blurring of vision to complete loss of vision there may be uh, facial or periorbital swelling there may be uh, just uh, uh, bartering discharge, uh, chemosis, or and there may be severe proptosis, or with ophthalmop, uh, there may be diplopia or ophthalmoplegia. And in, in some cases, exposed cases, a patient may present with corneal ulceration. This is a, uh, this was a, a typical case of uh, left orbital uh, mucormycosis in which uh, there was left ophthalmoplegia with myeltosis, and uh, there was uh, mild proptosis also uh, along with conjectival chemosis. It may present as extensive disease in which uh, there was uh, uh, visual SR over the necrotic area of the face, the large area was involved. There may be uh, destruction of soft tissue, mucosa and bone, nasal terminate, hard palate. Uh, there may be involvement of maxilla. And uh, in even very advanced cases, there may be gross destruction of the face and skull base. 
टेटोलॉजिकल इन्वेस्टिगेशन इट इज वन ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट फैक्टर एज मेनी केसेज कल्चर नेगेटिव और ऑन केव्स नेगेटिव uh only with clinical suspicion and radiological feature uh, we have started uh, uh, treatment in this case uh, due to its uh, advantage mri is a uh, better place for uh, uh, this case as uh, it has uh, better delineate uh, soft tissue involvement uh, involvement of the orbital apex Involvement of the cavernous sinus uh, can be easily uh, detected on MRI. So, uh, uh, extent of disease can be uh, uh, delineated on the MRI. And uh, most important part was uh, how to go for uh, its management, uh, especially surgical debridement. And again, it was very helpful in post-operative follow-up to uh, ascertain whether uh, disease was progressing uh, static or uh, patient is improving. Uh, this was a case uh, of uh, in, uh, mucormycosis in which uh, there was a left maxillary and ethmoidal sinusitis with inflammatory soft tissue involvement of the orbit uh, with enhancing opt optic nerve shape in this uh, photograph. And here in this case, uh, there was Post uh, axial post contrast image showed the uh, inflammatory soft tissue at orbital apex into, uh, extending into the left cavernous sinus, suggestive of thrombophlebitis with uh, narrow left in internal carotid artery. And in this photograph, uh, one can see the normal right uh, ophthalmic artery and occluded non visual left ophthalmic artery. Many cases, uh, uh, in almost all the cases, were sent to the ENT specialist for uh, KOH uh, first uh, sa sample uh, from the deep nasal swab, uh, from the deep nasal space, or from uh, endoscopic guided uh, sample that was sent to the microbiologist for uh, KOH, uh, KOH mount and smear. And uh, in uh, most of the cases, uh, we got uh, broad accepted hyphae with irregular diameter and uh, uh, right angle uh, uh, angulation of the these hyphae was uh, very typical. And uh, one of the cases in which uh, Rhizopus RIG was identified on lactophenol cotton blue stain. In some cases, uh, histopathology was uh, very uh, suggestive of uh, mucormacular. In this uh, respiratory epithelium uh, was identified in a uh, pulmonary sample uh, in which uh, there was a broad non septate fungal hyphae with frequent right angle branching on H and E stain. And on pass uh, stain, uh, there was uh, it was seen uh, in this case. So coming to the management, management was mainly based on again uh, the outline given by uh, Honavar Etel in which uh, in a stage one to two and three and uh, three A and B uh, first uh, uh, after debridement endoscopy, uh, either endoscopy or open debridement, patient was uh, given embotters in B. Uh, liposomal embotrocin V and if uh, there is uh, there was a deterioration then patient was taken for uh, exenteration uh, especially in cases of uh, stage 3 A to C and in stage 3 C and D uh, again uh, if there was limited in uh, only orbital involvement then orbital exenteration was done uh, along with medical management in a stage 4 C and D uh, extends in cases of extensive involvement. Only uh, medical management was given. These are some of the intraoperative photograph as uh, uh, there was a team of uh, general surgeon, onco surgeon, uh, uh, maxillofacial surgeon was working. So many cases were done, done through open route. So, uh, these are the uh, cases where open debridement was done, and this was the case uh, where lead, uh, eyelid sparing exenteration was done. 
so before presenting my data uh, i will present uh, one of the uh, largest uh, uh, retrospective of the study done by uh, Oculoplastic Association of India and the IGO collaborative group. They have uh, pulled data from uh, 102 uh, treatment center and uh, total number of cases were uh, 2,826. In their uh, retrospective study, they found that the mean age was 59.9 year, 51.9 years, sorry. And uh, out of them, 78% uh, the history of uh, diabetes. And in uh, 690 cases, there was hypertension, uh, associated hypertension. And in 88 cases, patients were uh, uh, patient uh, renal disease. In the hospitalization was again, uh, uh, teen in cases of, sorry. Uh, Again, uh, hospitalization was uh, in few cases, there was a history of hospitalization with uh, oxygen therapy. Uh, in uh, cases uh, in 2073, uh, 2073 cases, there was a history of corticosteroid. Coming to the primary system, uh, what was the primary system? Primary system, most important uh, primary symptom was uh, orbitofacial pain. Then uh, orbitofacial edema, loss of vision in 19% of cases, ptosis in 11% of cases, nasal block in 9% of cases. Then uh, primary sign, again, uh, periocular edema, it was seen, uh, uh, ocular and facial edema was seen in 33% uh, of cases, loss of vision in 21%, and ptosis in 12%, uh, proptosis in 11% of cases and other uh, rare finding was nasal ulcer, diplopia, periocular facial discoloration, periocular hypostasia. In uh, regarding CNS involved, uh, PNS involvement, uh, diffuse PNS involvement was seen in 58% of cases, bilateral PNS involvement was in 40% of cases. In orbital, you know, again, diffuse involvement was seen in 40% of cases and uh, orbital effects was involved in 21%. Regarding CNS involvement, uh, cavernous sinus involvement in 53% of cases and bilateral CNS involvement was seen in 55% of cases. Coming to the our data, a total of uh, as our hospital was de uh, designated uh, as uh, Center for Excellence for uh, Mucor Mycosis Care. So, uh, 219 cases were reported either uh, in different departments, uh, and uh, there was a dedicated uh, mucor uh, OPD. Uh, out of uh, we have seen uh, either patient were reported or we have seen uh, got referral from different uh, area in 110 uh, patient. So we have data of 110 patient. Out of them, uh, both I was involved equally and uh, uh, there was involvement of uh, 10, in 10% 10 cases, both I was involved. Again, mean age of uh, uh, presentation uh, was 49.9 year. Again, almost similar to the uh, data published by uh, Cosmic study. Duration, uh, uh, again, the duration of uh, duration between onset of COVID and mucormycosis symptom was uh, reliably, reliably obtained in 64%, uh, 64 patients. Uh, uh, again, mean was 20.9 uh, plus minus uh, 12.6 days. Again, uh, uh, similar to cosmic study, uh, male to female ratio was uh, 2.2 to 1. And out of uh, 110 patient, uh, most of the patients were from uh, Bihar itself, and the rest six patients from uh, neighboring states. So uh, the ratio of North Bihar to South Bihar, uh, it, again, uh, South Bihar to North Bihar, it was again two to almost two to one. Coming to the presenting complaint, uh, most common presenting complaint was ocular or facial pain in 69 cases, uh, diminution of vision in 56 cases, 
doping of upper lead uh, in 46 cases, periorbital or facial swelling in 42 cases. Coming to the comorbidities, uh, again uh, similar to cosmic study, in 82% of cases there was history of diabetes mellitus, uh, there was a history of uh, hypertension and uh, heart disease in 34% uh, of cases and 10% of other comorbidities like hypothyroid, uh, hyperthyroid, anti-cancer therapy and chronic kidney disease. Coming to the duration of diabetes mellitus in uh, reported cases, 13 cases were recently diagnosed, probably due to uh, they were borderline diabetic, and uh, rest of the cases were either uh, recently diagnosed diabetic cases or uh, patient may not be aware of uh, from how much duration uh, patient has diabetes. In steroid use, we have taken history of uh, what were the different type of uh, steroid was used, whether uh, IV methylprednisolone was used, IV dexamethasone or oral dexamethasone or oral prednisolone was used. So in most of the uh, patient, uh, IV dexamethasone was used, uh, then IV methylprednisone, um, in less number of cases, IV methylprednisone and oral dexamethasone was used. Coming to the hospitalization uh, due to COVID, in uh, 23 uh, patients were uh, hospitalized patients and out of uh, these 38% uh, were diagnosed as COVID, uh, COVID positive by RT-PCR. We have not taken a rapid antigen test as uh, positive for COVID and uh, regarding du duration of the hospitalization, again, uh, it was a range of 5 to 30 days and uh, out of them, 17 gave definite history of oxygen therapy during hospitalization. Coming to the presenting visual equity, out of 220 I, 34 were PL negative in 10, uh, it was just PL and uh, in 147 cases, uh, vision was better than, uh, 147 I, vision was better than, uh, less than uh, 660. Coming to the ocular mortality, again, uh, in 23 cases, there was just limitation in one or two gauge, and in uh, 33 uh, eyes, there was a limitation in all the gauges, and in 22 eyes, there was frozen eye. We have also checked uh, sensation, light touch, deep touch, and uh, painful uh, stimulus was given and it was found that uh, supraorbital sensation was uh, decreased in almost 39 cases compared to infraorbital sensation in uh, 44, uh, 50, uh, 54 cases. Coming to the interior segment finding uh, of uh, ROCM, uh, ptosis was the most common finding, then axial proptosis, uh, conjectival congestion, diminished corneal sensation and uh, bilateral eyelid SR uh, was seen in, in only one patient, subcontinual hemorrhage in three patients and uh, pressure was, uh, IOP was increased in uh, eight eyes. Coming to the pupillary abnormality, in uh, around 24 eyes, uh, there was non-reactive pupil and uh, in uh, 22, uh, there was RFPD and in five cases, the uh, pupil was sluggish reacting. Coming to the fundus finding, uh, we have got in 21 uh, cases, uh, there was uh, features of uh, thalamic artery occlusion. In six cases, there was central retinal artery occlusion. In three cases, there was a feature of optic neuritis, uh, disc edema like feature, cotton school, uh, cotton loss spot. Uh, was seen in two cases. There was also seen vitritis, uh, choroidal folds. These are some of the picture. Uh, a case with multiple soft burette. Uh, there was isolated uh, inferior temporal cotonless spot. This was a case of reperfused CRA with ciliaretinal artery sparing. Case. This was a case uh, with uh, ophthalmic artery occlusion with white out retina. 
and uh, this was a case of typical CRIO with uh, typical cherry red spot. So to summarize, mucormycosis is a highly aggressive fungal infection affecting diabetics, immunocompromised and occasionally healthy patients. ROCM may present with varied type of manifestation from mild uh, facial or ocular pain to complete vision loss and necrosis of the involved area. High index of suspicion supplemented with nasal endoscopy, direct microscopy with KOH, smear examination, culture and histopathology of nasal, paranasal, orbital samples helps in early diagnosis and it prevents subsequent devastating complications. MRI with MRI, MRI angiography is superior to CT scan in estimating extent of orbital effects and cavernous sinus involvement. And diabetes in indiscriminate use of a steroid and other immunosuppressive agents coupled with mutation in coronavirus are probable risk factor of sudden surge of mycormycosis during second wave of COVID-19 pandemic. I am thankful to Dr. Poonam Madani, HOD Pathology, Dr. Grandi Bhavna, HOD ENT, Dr. Vasna Sina, my better half, Associate Professor Radio Diagnosis, Dr. Pratyusa, and uh, my senior Dr. Pratik for helping me with different photo and the collection of different uh, uh, compilation of samples. So thank you all for patient hearing. Dr. Amit, thank you, Dr. Amit. It was really a very lucid presentation. And uh, you, that topic has been of current interest to everyone. And we know that AIMS Patna actually has really participated a lot, done a lot in this mycormycosis management. So in our place, uh, Dr. Arunpam uh, from our department has been involved and the institution has done around 400 cases, mainly by the ENT people. And from ophthalmology, Dr. Anupam has been looking after. And That's good, sir. So, uh, Dr. Anupam is there. She can share some uh, experiences with them. Or if there are any questions by the audience, please, they can uh, send in the chat box. Dr. Ramanjit, also, if you want to share something from PGI Chandigarh. Yeah, uh, First of all, Dr. Amit, it was a great presentation. You know? I, mean, I was just wondering, uh, you did not see any uh, endophthalmitis like picture in any of these cases? Uh, probably not, sir. Uh, in one case, there was a... Uh, in one case, we got a picture of uh, endophthalmitis probably. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, as patient was very sick, so it was very difficult to remove uh, sample. So right. we have gone for just conservative management. I can understand the. Uh, it is known that it doesn't cause endophthalmitis in many of the patients. It causes uh, more problems due to the orbital involvement. So this was uh, nicely seen in your question. It's a great work actually. You guys have done a good job. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amit. It was a very uh, elaborative talk also. And uh, uh, I just also want to submit that we have also seen almost 120 to 30 cases of mucormycosis and we have treated uh, here also at Ames Bathenda in collaboration with ENT, radiologist, microbiology. And uh, we have seen all kind of complications, CRAOs and um, Exentration, uh, uh, they were done by uh, our uh, colleague, uh, that Dr. Vaibhav Sani, he is uh, HOD of ENT department. And uh, uh, we have seen, I have seen personally two cases of endophthalmitis uh, in that, um, see, uh, that uh, with the case, uh, one I was exaggerated, other I uh, developed that uh, endophthalmitis and we have referred that case to PGI Chandigarh for further management. Uh, I don't know whether that case has reached you yet or not. But uh, CRO in most of the cases when uh, uh, it was uh, seen, uh, CRO was the major picture we have seen that with PR denied eyes and all. So we have also seen so many cases and uh, it was a real nightmare for ophthalmologists also because when one eye is exaggerated and other eye is also having such kind of picture, it is really uh, very uh, you know uh, disheartening to us. Yeah, so, cases, uh, two three cases were presented with bilateral PL negative by so that was uh, very painful to for us to see. Yeah, because ophthalmologists are not uh, you know uh, used to see such kind of exaggerated eye with the uh, free flowing sockets with the nose and mucosa seen through that, and we are seeing yeah. the other eye 
and uh, it was uh, one of the case presented that they uh, that uh, anesthesia person they wanted to intubate from that area from the excentrated mm -hmm. the socket they said ki just see whether there is globe or not because we mm -hmm. want that space because patient is not able to uh, you know open the mouth so for some kind of uh, uh, surgical intervention the anesthesia was given from that orbit site because uh, orbit was not there from that uh, um, hole which was made by excentration so that was very you know that was very disheartening and uh, we are not uh, you know <laughs> able to see such kind of presentation which come to us in this era so it was really heartbreaking for uh, all the ophthalmologists this mucor mycosis we have seen cases in our senior residency in our junior residency but now we are seeing those flooded you know these cases are flooding even now covid 19 is going it is okay but still we are seeing maybe we are getting more sensitized to these cases every case with proptosis and ptosis we are just going for the nasal examination because they are presenting to us also half of the cases are coming to us yeah, with yeah yeah many cases are With ophthalmic manifestation, naturally they present to the ophthalmic operator. Then we uh, uh, sent all the patient to ENT for uh, first uh, uh, deep nasal swab or endoscopic nasal swab and examination. Then uh, we uh, proceed for management. Yeah, I can see Dr. Shweta also here. She is a very good friend of mine, and she is alumni of PGI. Uh, Chandigarh. Have you have any kind of experience on mucor mycosis, Dr. Shweta? Can you share? Here? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, especially my my esteemed seniors, Dr. Andrada. It was a very nice talk, and uh, nice to see you, Dr. Raman. And uh, it was nice. Uh, yeah, Dr. Amit and Dr. Anupma, your talks were also brilliant. Hello, Dr. Manish. Uh, I am Dr. Shweta. I am a private practice in Bhatinda. Yes, in COVID nineteen, all uh, although I was doing the video calls only, but then there were uh, a lot of patients who had come uh, with mucor mycosis. Main presentation was proptosis, and uh, I also did see a um, central retinal artery occlusions, and uh, uh, I had seen cases of panophthalmitis and endogenous endophthalmitis in both the eyes. We had got a call from the ICU. Uh, saying that the patient had lost vision and uh, it was seen that the patient had uh, exudates in both the uh, vitreous uh, so and that case was managed by PGI uh, later on but then the main problem was that the systemic condition was so bad that it could not be referred in time and then um, they they reached uh, so one of the eye had already developed an RD and the other eye the silicone oil and all was put but then that patient is maintaining. Uh, good vision. There is another, um, you know. So all these uh, patients are having uh, um, uh, mobility still now, and it is actually. But uh, what, the story that I heard from you is actually unimaginable. That uh, one I exaggerated, and the anesthetist wanted to intubate from yeah. that area. <laughs> yes, that was nightmare for us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, in the first uh, wave of uh, COVID nineteen, a few cases presented like that in our ICU because we started here the uh, indoor services in first wave only. Uh, so uh, we could see those cases and we used to uh, uh, be called for that uh, fundus examination. That patient is saying I cannot see. So at that time, uh, mucor mycosis were not uh, around the corner and nobody was knowing what is happening. But we saw those cases with CRO, bilateral CRO. But uh, due to that, uh, so much of uh, pneumonia and all, all the uh, you know uh, kind of uh, bad uh, and this kind of uh, lungs and all, those patients uh, were there in the ICU. But uh, we could see, and retrospectively, we uh, went to that uh, uh, thing that okay, those patients were also having the mucor mycosis. But uh, those patients, out of those, one patient died because that was very unstable with the uh, uncontrolled uh, and diabetes and all. So uh, this was a real thing uh, which every ophthalmologist has <laughs> come across in this era. In first wave of uh, COVID nineteen, our hospital was dedicated COVID hospital, and uh, I think uh, our hospital had managed around more than three thousand uh, patient COVID patient. But we had not got any call for uh, sudden loss of vision. Although we have done one project also on retinal manifestation of COVID nineteen. But we have not uh, basically uh, there no patient was diagnosed or no such patient with uh, sudden loss of vision or any suspicion for mucor mycosis uh, in first wave. That was amazing. Uh, 
so naturally uh, there must be some mutation but uh, diabetes by their in first wave uh, steroid by their in first wave immunosuppressors by their in first wave so uh, must be there was due to mutation of the virus uh, it was uh, uh, there was a number of cases as uh, suddenly uh, presented in second wave i think my, it's my view um, maybe there was some other pathogenesis no, 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 dr amit actually in our place also like uh, central retinal artery occlusion has been the commonest one complication yes sir and in fact thankfully our ent team and other like uh, team was very strong so they really worked like commandos all throughout and mortality was also very too high yeah. mortality in our place uh, we have two ent surgeon they are very dynamic but uh, although there are so much number of cases so they have to call uh, the uh, ent clinic from e ams kalyani he was just staying for 15 days even after that it was not possible to do uh, endoscopic sinus surgery in all the cases so general surgeon uh, onco surgeon was involved to do uh, debridement in uh, by open method so this, uh, that was the situation at that time so uh, it was very painful to see uh, this dr patient. amit there is one question uh, in the chat box for you if you would like that is the staging system based on clinical or endoscopic or based on hp or combination of all is there any study on identification in stage 1 and its progression to stage 2 or 3 or 4 such a rapidly progressive disease how this staging going to help please elaborate it's by dr shivanand tham k actually this staging was based on a radiological finding involvement of different structure whether in a stage 1 Uh, nasal cavity uh, was involved in uh, stage 2 sin different sinuses were involved and in stage 3 orbit and uh, again in stage 4 uh, brain was uh, uh, first cavernous sinus then brain was so it, it doesn't uh, basically in different cases it may not be uh, like a disease you can find it in a stage 1 only there may be overlapping of stage 1 and 2 or stage 2 and 3 so naturally uh, all the factors clinical as well as radiological uh, features were uh, taken into consideration for staging and uh, initially uh, in old staging system there was only three stage but in uh, newer staging system proposed staging system there was four stage just for managing this case uh, <coughs> yes any have uh, any different uh, it's uh, yes, idea about the staging no, no, you are technique. actually you are right dr amit i, th I think you are the, the, what you said is the correct thing actually so we have to base on that uh, that time also there is a great overlap actually the presentation so one has to use their own clinical sense that time yes this so i just want to ask that uh, i just want to ask one question that um, from especially my colleagues at uh, medical colleges that um if i see a central retinal artery occlusion case now like a 50 year old although uncontrolled hypertensive should i also uh, think on uh, for my courses line because i just saw a cra case uh i think uh, uh sir can uh, better answer this case it's a general actually here dr amit raj please please currently we are not uh, sending uh, the patient until this uh, there is some associated symptom like uh, facial pain or some yeah. uh, nasal finding uh, we are not sending all the cases uh, for yeah. ent evaluation but again we are sending some cases we have uh, some suspicion of uh, mucormycosis we are sending to ent people for diagnosis okay so uh, i have a submission uh, there is a, a classification that is uh, uh, for that uh, mucormycosis that is probable possible and proven probable are those cases where there are the risk factor like uh, patient is having covid 19 uh, history along with immunocompromised status may be having uh, uncontrolled diabetes and presenting with all those clinical features that uh, can be taken as uh, probable and possible if clinical uh, uh, that clinical as well as radiological picture radiological and the third is proven proven is that where we histopathology or histopathology that, or uh, microscopy 
yes microscopy is showing these then it is proven so we can uh, take uh, in these uh, three stages when we have to classify th these kind of patients depending on the risk factor and clinical picture so we have also managed, uh, sir, uh, being a new institute, we have managed almost 200 cases at uh, AIMS Bathinda. And uh, at AIMS uh, Bathinda, in and around, all the cases were uh, sent to us only. Civil hospital made uh, AIMS Bathinda as a hub for uh, mycomycosis cases. All the cases which were coming in the civil hospital and in and around, uh, they were uh, sent to us. And our ENT colleagues, they have really worked hard and they have done day and night examinations and all. And uh, we have also managed those cases with the uh, tram and um, for um, most of the cases, means 50% of cases, they came to our OPD only for of that of thermoplegia and ptosis. And sometimes with the loss of vision due to CRU and uh, panophthalmitis. Uh, I have not seen any case of panophthalmitis. Mm, great. Can we ask Dr. Lavi to take up now for the next for Dr. Lavi? Dr. Lavi. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for uh, your inputs. So uh, our next topic for discussion is uh, post-operative endophthalmitis, uh, tips uh, and tricks to early diagnosis by Dr. Ramandeep Singh. He is a professor uh, in PGI Chandigarh. I welcome you, uh, Dr. Ramandeep Singh, sir. Uh, you have uh, really, you are given very less time for this presentation, but uh, we are sorry for that. And uh, you accepted our invitation. We are thankful to you and uh, over to you, sir for your talk. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, Dr. Radha, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can. I go to the next speaker. I, 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 can I take the next one, please? Uh, okay. So uh, the next topic uh, and next speak, uh, speaker is Dr. Manish Dhawan. So over to you, Dr. Lavi. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, our next topic of discussion is microbial agents used in ophthalmology and their resistance by Dr. Munish Dhawan, uh, who is currently working as professor and head of department in Guru Gobind Singh Medical College, Faridkot. He has his post-graduation and senior residency from Ames, New Delhi. He has numerous index publications in various journals and has also served as editors for two books, that is Mastering Nucleotomy Techniques in Phaco Emulsification and a JP Video Atlas of Glaucoma Surgery. Uh, besides, he has also co-authored many chapters in various books. Over to you, sir, uh, for a discussion of antimicrobial agents used in ophthalmology and their resistance. Uh, am I audible to everyone? <laughs> yes, sir. So please ask, uh, please allow the screen to be shared, Dr. Anuradha. So we, we have made you as a co-host. Can you share that? Just see uh, that uh, green color button, share screen. Sir, you are mute. So can you un unmute yourself? I have unmuted myself. Okay, now you are audible, sir. So the screen is not able to share. In the message is showing that host has disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, sir. So I have to take some technical help for that. So uh, Dr. Ramandeep, sir, are you ready with your presentation now? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Dr. Ramandeep, not yet. So should oh. I take up then? Yeah, yeah, sir. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I take a Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, now I will uh, invite uh, <coughs> Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Mittal. He is professor and head uh, at Ames Rishikesh, and uh, his uh, topic uh, for presentation is ophthalmic OT infection control. It was uh, demanded by me only. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, we are going to start our OT and we want to see what we have to do in our uh, uh, setting up the OT of uh, our own. 
so thank you sir for uh, in, uh, getting uh, the uh, for getting us the opportunity that we'll be hearing you in a short while thank you is and, my uh, presentation visible yes sir it is okay good afternoon everyone uh, i am presenting uh, ophthalmic ot infection control today why it is important for all of us as we know that any ophthalmologist is scared of the most dreaded complication of intraocular surgery and that is endophthalmitis dr ramandeep would be all enlightening us on that how to treatment tackle that and what are the the and the, we are concerned with the after effects ot may have to be shut down clinical reputation of the ophthalmologist is affected leading to psychological problems at times a financial compensation do occur and sometimes a violence may occur from the patient side sometimes media may also aggravate the problem further so what are the sources of infection in ot contaminated ot environment like unclean air conditioning system construction work if is going on contaminated instruments instruments are junked used residual viscoelastic mat material again used cotton tip applicators fake hand piece not sterilized properly contaminated solutions drugs used intraocularly or ocular topically and the faulty autoclaving sterilizing methods <clears throat> all may lead to this so what's the remedy by creating an sterile environment in operation theaters there is a major part of such exogenous infection which can be controlled so how to create a sterile environment in ot by we can by adhering to standard ot designing and barrier systems ot protocols for cleaning sterilization and waste disposal fumigation microbiology surveillance proper hand washing measures for the surgeon and scrub surgical assistants and the eye surgery is preferably should be done in a dedicated iots and when there are several cases the case order should be clean cases first and infected cases at the end so this all we would be discussing a suggested ot layout is like uh, where we divide the ot theater complex in four zones the first is a protective of the primary zone and then the clean zone second zone mid zone and the third is the aseptic zone where the real operation rooms are located and the disposal zone so the first zone the outer zone protective zone is where where the changing rooms i mean all those zones should be separated with some doors purpose is that the air and this thing should be all separated from there so the change rooms transfer bays rooms for administrative staff stores and records pre and post operative rooms are all located there clean zone or the mid zone is where the equipment are stored maintenance workshop kitchenette fire fighting device room emergency exit service room for staff close circuit tv control area like these are all ex there it all depends upon like your setup like when you are working in a big hospital or in a clinical your own clinic then how do you manage that that is giving the basic guideline and then the aseptic zone where with scrubbing grounding the gowning and gloving operation rooms are located then is the disposal zone disposal zone is like where from the all operation theaters and the corridors all used equipments and the supplies used linens are disposed of so those those things should not be brought again to the your main area again so that route should be separate while in the architecture of the ophthalmic ot a few just guidelines are that preferably it should be on first floor and i mean not on the top floor because of the purpose of leakage other things may occur if similarly the ground floor is also avoided if you have multi storied building the recommended size actually he is a normally is about 20 feet 21 by 21 feet but our latest ais guidelines actually they had recommended now that we can go smaller than that out almost 160 square feet with the latest guidelines published this month it is recommended to have one operation table in per operation theater but we know that with all practical purposes when the theater size is big we have to so these are the guidelines one can see to it the doors preferably should be sliding doors and the size should be big enough to allow to the stretcher should be able to pass through it comfortably we have to take care of the surface and flooring actually that uh, that flooring should be slip water and scratch resistant should be washable smooth 
jointless the, if there are tiles it should be jointless conductive tiles or with some linoleum flooring if they are vitrified tiles then it should have epoxy grating which is considered best the junctions of uh, uh, this wall and the floor <clears throat> it should have uh, it should be continuous curved section so that there is a ease of cleaning and it avoids stasis of water or contaminants the walls should have actually laminated polyester or smooth paint alternatively stainless steel that provides a seamless wall uh, this is just to show uh, our operation theater is a modular theater we have two theaters so that what i was talking about that walls and the flooring and the uh, it's not a steel flooring it's not a steel walls but the flooring to show that and one table so basic running care of the operation theater is for the ventilation cleaning part disinfection and sterilization positive pressure ventilation is something which is considered very good for the operation theater direction of the air flow should be from ot towards the main entrance and there should be no interchange of air movement between one theater to other theater like we have several theater in one block so that air should not be interchangeable and the non recirculating air is ideal whenever we talking about positive pressure ventilation as a central air conditioning system so this is to be taken care this is just a diagram to show air handling units the air which enter outside air enters and then it passes inside and then exhaust normally the central air conditioning system it there is a 25% air normally is fresh every time so there there's a continuous fresh air is coming from inside and this lamellar air flow system should uh, connected with a hipa filter hipa filter takes care of bacteria and viruses and with the hipa units efficiency rating is it reaches to 99.9% there are certain important physical parameters for operation room ventilation the temperature should be should range between 18 to 25 degrees celsius humidity should be around 55% and the air exchange per hour cycle should be around around 25 and the air flow movement should be from clean to lesser clean areas the microbial counts in the air bacterial bacterial count should not exceed 35.5 colony forming units per meter cube similarly like the air entering the ot from the filter should have should be less than 0.5 so that is all it's i mean how this is measured then cleaning of operation theaters the dry area is preferred like because the dry area causes natural death of bacteria except the spores so one should actually the vacuum cleaners or the wet mop should be used and the brooms dry mops duster should not be used use of simple detergent reduces flora by 80% while adding disinfectant it makes to 95% so the floor should be cleaned twice or thrice a day suppose we have a long list and the pesticide should be sprayed once a week the walls should be cleaned once in two weeks at least if they are all clean cases and air conditioner should be cleaned like a, with a vacuum cleaning or if there are filters then those should be cleaned once in a week refrigerator and the sinks in that ot complex at least should be cleaned once in two weeks after every case like uh, if if like suppose extracellular surgeries has been done other things like so body fluids blood spills so all th things should be cleaned up and uh, soil gowns they all be discarded from the theater and uh, in our place we are using d256 and for sept septic cases we use for 1% sodium hypochlorite here and the all the equipment similarly are arranged for proper for the next cases D256 is dyes dye desyl high dimethyl ammonium chloride and an alkali dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride is the constituent so after the last case the ot should be cleaned like the all the articles are removed the bigger one are removed from the theater and sorted out trolleys and the floor are cleaned table tops door handles they are clean with the either with the some detergent or preferably we are using low disinfectant in low concentration so phenol can be used 1 is to 10 ratio or d25 to 256 2% basal oil is special 100 ml in 5 liter of water is mixed 1% but any one of this with the 
availability can be used or 1% sodium hypochlorite solution can be used. So the scrub areas, liquid soap and scrub solution dispenser, scrub sink, drain, corridors, patient holding area equipments, all these has to be cleaned. The lenses of the microscope, operating microscope, all those has to be cleaned with the cleaner provided with that. None of that uh, this chemical otherwise should be used. There are weekly cleaning schedules also like some something like all the OTs should be uh, every week all the article and instrument from the OT should be cleaned. They are moved out and the whole even the theater corridor everything should be cleaned. So like uh, like I just discussed some floor other places and walls they are clean air filters are clean. Then hand washing. Hand washing this is uh, everyone actually is aware of that just a sort of a little Division of that clean area towards the less clean area, 10% chlor betadine or chlorhexidine solution is used at least for three minutes. The fumigation uh, is should be done at weekly intervals and uh, after every infective case. If the case, infective case is done, that day should be done. And when the OT is closed for long period, some places like after due to Corona OT, the routine OT were closed. So when you are start restarting the theaters, so there should be at least three subsequent fumigations with three consecutive negative culture reports of OT, which are mandatory to restart the theater. So, however, the fumigation is not required if this is a positive pressure ventilation in the OT, like in modular theaters, they are they are having positive pressure ventilation that this is not required. So for fumigation, the chemical disinfection, uh, disinfectants used are formaldehyde fumigation, but this is not preferred because of toxicity reasons. So D125 solution is used, or aldecol, basiloate recent, basilol, and ultraviolet radiation. So like uh, it all depends upon your the feasibility and availability in your institutions or in your place or in, when you are in clinic, what is all available. Instruments and done prepared. They are separated from the sharp instruments are separated from the blunt instruments. They are clean for the dirt and the organic material either manually with the brushing. Like for brushing, we can just you take a little a toothbrush or soft bristle that can also be used for cleaning that. And then mechanical cleaning is done with the ultrasound. So in ophthalmology, we know that ultrasound cleaning is very important for us for cannulas which gets blocked. And they should be dried up, lubricant, lubricate, the joints are lubricated and then are packaged. So there are various methods of sterilization, autoclaving, hot air oven, ethylene oxide, plasma system, glutaraldehyde is a chemical one. Glut like chemical sterilization for the instruments is not, not recommended nowadays. We use mostly depend on autoclaving or flash autoclaving, fast autoclaving, or hot air ovens, or plasma system, ethylene oxide. Like for the FACO surgeries, FACO probe, uh, I just want to share like uh, we actually were having also plasma system using for FACO probe. Then unfortunately, we just uh, we got one uh, in, uh, endophthalmitis in patient. Then we just looked into this probe into that. Then we found, OK, that uh, FACO people actually that they recommend it should be autoclaved, not be plasma. So little these things should be known. Like we know that autoclaving is otherwise good. But uh, this ethylene oxide is very good. But after ethylene oxide, then instrument should be used three days after that, not immediately. So that monitoring of sterilization is done with the indicators. So we have chemical indicators and biological indicators. So chemical indicators, they are like uh, they are wrapped outside uh, inside and in the trays out over the packet and then outside the box. Then biological indicators, they should also be used at least once in a month or three once in a month or six, three months, depending upon institutional policies. And we use uh, some of these biomonitors like for steam process, this geobacillus and steatothermophilus is used. And for ethylene oxide processing to check it, we use bacillus subtilis spores. So chemical strips, uh, these are the chemical strips. Then microbiological monitoring is important. The swipes are collected from various locations in the operation theater. Like uh, the policy in our place is every two weeks. But the AIS recommendation is slightly, slightly given some relaxation to it. 
so i think that is all because uh, taking into consideration of private clinics or smaller places also so one can look into that if uh, give uh, how genuinely they are doing and they are concerned for their personalization if they are sure enough but we are doing it two weekly and the area to be swabbed include operation table at the head end overhead lamp microscope uh, this microscope handles microscopes of uh, this objectives the floor walls the walls floor below and head end of the table instrument trolley ac ducts and the air <clears throat> for taking a sample in the air all microbiology the people they send their technician and our ot technician they are supposed to supervise all that the 10 cm blood agar plate is kept open at the head end of table for 30 minutes for really knowing the air uh, taking the sample of air germs <clears throat> for monitoring of air quality there is a two methods of settle plate method and then slit sampler methods so basically the concern is that the bacterial colony count of more than 10 per plate and fungal colony of more than one per plate are considered unacceptable <clears throat> this is a sort of report we get and uh, every time like a colony count of less than 10 with not even a single gram negative bacillus or fungal colony this is the acceptable report from the floor ac vent patient bed i mean the ot table light wall dressing table and op open air plate then this uh, sterilization should be monitored by the ot nurses and the uh, faculty in charge or the operator the ophthalmologist in between sometimes randomly should just check whether they are maintaining log book and a surprise check should be done other issues are pest control and overhead water tank uh, aqua guard like this water filtration plant they should be cleaned regularly then biomedical waste management that red yellow blue white black this all this should should be followed then the dirty corridors as i just mentioned in the previous slide all used articles are removed from the theater through a hatch window opening into a dirty corridor if like uh, this is a real prototype but uh, like one can have a separate route of exit for the dirty linen and the dust thing instrument other things so other specification like uh, all items should be labeled with date of sterilization all the every sterilized item has an expiry date and items must be inspected before use once package has been opened it is no longer considered a sterile so don't store non sterile items with sterile items and in, if sterility of an item cannot be assessed it must be resterilized or discarded <laughs> then as a surgeon and for our assistants or nursing staff what uh, the ophthalmologist should look for sometimes randomly whether this is being followed so anyone including doctor or staff with a fever or any obvious systemic or local infection should not be allowed to enter the theater allow the presence of only a limited number of personnel inside the viewing monitors need to be placed outside the theater like right? not in the uh, clean area in the mid zone the shoe covers of the, over the street or the external use footwear are not recommended so actor external footwear should be removed outside the theater i mean the, in the area 1 the shoe should be removed outside outside the area 1 then you come and change in area 1 and clean ot specific footwear should be used within the ot here i would just mention that even for using the washroom that uh, the sleeper should be separate separate uh, like uh, separate washable rubber ot footwear with ot specific color coding is desirable Uh, and the ot dress should be cleaned and washed and every time new dress should be used no street clothes should be allowed inside the ot even by the patient the doctor the staff the uh, gown the gowning the washing gowning gloving as we just discussed now hand scrubbing we discussed already 3 minutes should be done there is a little repetition the portable or purified water is to be used for scrubbing we can use ro water that is preferred otherwise practically ot etiquettes and important do's and don'ts have to be listed and posted in the ot area so that we make maintain one sop and everyone follow that because like in medical colleges new residents are coming every time so they should also be apprised of that a fresh new pair of sterile gloves are to be used for every case and uh, we may use chemical uh, 70% isopropyl alcohol after wearing our uh, the gloves we can wash with that A sterile gown is mandatory. 
surgeon should not come out of the OR room, operation room, in a gown. They should not come out from that to corridor. So then it's better to change the gown for the next and for the next case or otherwise change the gown. Mask should cover the nose and mouth properly. And in this COVID time also, it has become more pertinent for even the surgeons and the assistants also. OT cap should be worn properly, tucking in all hair. So it uh, always reminds us the OT is the most sacred area. It's a temple of any surgical setup. The OT staff technicians are most important person for a successful surgery. And the best indicator, best indicator for any ophthalmologist is keep your eyes, ear, nose open. That is the best indicator. Keep on checking even your OT staff, because we are trusting our OT staff, but in between randomized, you should take care of that part, check that, take them into confidence. So this is all about, thank you very much. Sir, uh, I just want to ask, what are the protocols you are following these days for IOT, uh, whether you are getting COVID-19 uh, RT-PCR for each and every case or? Uh... We, we we were having till uh, till uh, today till yesterday rather i would say yeah. and because that icmr guideline recently has come that uh, no this all testing is required now anymore for any if patient is having cl is clinically asymptomatic no testing is required so in a, in concurrence with that our administ hospital administration also passed circular from today this is stopped okay. but i i think like others can also think of uh, we feel like uh, my other all colleagues here will also agree we have yeah. to be cautious yes we have to be cautious because uh, yeah. the, the virus i personally feel the virus is uh, we do not know the nature of the virus you know like uh, <laughs> absolutely right sir even even pj has uh, got the orders yesterday only uh, yeah. so i think it is important to know that uh, now we can put uh, about your talk we sir, just follow the others or is based on the, some scientific Data. I think ICMR has given this ruling, sir. It has came from the ICMR study. There may be many other reasons uh, for the ICMR guideline. Yeah, I, I, I don't <laughs> get to do all this. Director, sir, actually, that's what the, the that's what the, it's an individual decision, sir. That's yeah. what. <laughs> I think they believe that it's endemic now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have money to test. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's very expensive. Yeah, it's very expensive. Huh? Yeah. So, Thank you, Dr. Mittal. Actually, this uh, topic was of good interest of mine because yes, uh, when know, we sir, did I, our uh, graduation know, and post-graduation, uh, it was not much emphasis on the sterility in the operation theater or sterility in the ward and so many things. Yes, sir. And, uh, you talked about fumigation of the OT. Yes, sir. Yes, what sir. chemicals should be used for fumigation? And uh, the same thing that because they follow in the ICU area, then yes, others say that uh, I will do fumigation of the ICU. And you yes, know, sir. the ICU bed cannot be like vacated. At one time, every bed cannot be vacated. There must yes. be some uh, good things that which can be done on the patient or even the patient has treated in the bed. The same yes, thing... Sir. To do fumigation in the OT, we must take care of the because we, as an anesthetist, we suffer because most of the wire, um, monitors, wires, and other things, they are yes, get sir. affected by this fumigation. If you do yes, with the formalin. Yes, sir. So, uh, since we, I have seen uh, the surgeons and anesthetists walking yes, with sir. the shoes in the theater in US and uh, Canada, both the country. Uh, yes. Even the OT, which was doing knee replacement and uh, hip replacement. So, uh, yes. that uh, they also need to maintain that kind of uh, sterility in the operation theater. But they were walking with the shoes and they yes. were saying that because they, we uh, could maintain good uh, positive pressure and laminar flow. So, we don't need yes. to change. Yes. So, my first question is uh, what solution should be used for fumigation in the OT? So, they yes. should not damage the other things also. Yes, sir. Sir, actually, the, the, that's what uh, we also had a concern about our place. Mm -hmm. Initially, because of the modular theaters, uh, they were doing fumigation, but then they stopped because of that. But uh, I, it has been found now, like in our place for the last several years, they are not fumigating. They are cleaning with the D125 solution. 
and uh, that, that is mostly used like it all depends on the supply which is coming so d125 and then aldecol so these are actually basiloid so they are being no, micro seal d125 sir, uh, sir, sir. so what, what habit we have developed we have developed a habit of buying expensive thing yes sir, yes, sir. and but, d125 is an expensive item sir 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 so actually that actually uh, that without uh, knowing that uh, whether it is yeah, effective or it is hide, approved uh, by and you can be tested by the microbiology department of the institute sir actually i discussed with our microbiology colleague also also because the formaldehyde uh, because this is considered toxic so that is what they are well, they were using so it's not abundant actually but it is preferred that and it should use, be abundant it should be abundant because it damages the wires and uh, wirings Yes. And there are many, like uh, even if you have the modular routine, there are many wires uh, covered yes. by only this plastic cover, and, and they all get damaged. Yes, sir. And formaldehyde is toxic to uh, we people also, like all the staff also. Hmm. So, so it's basically the cleaning part is really that helps actually. And uh, when the ICU, suppose like the beds, uh, what we see the practice over here also that they take out the bed outside, or then uh, like whole thing cannot be done at a time. So then they take out the bed, clean it, clean that, or that they do it that way. No, I have one experience of using the oxidized water. I cannot say because I'm not a scientist and it was not very tight control study that it was really effective. But certainly I can say with the observation point of view that it was effective oxidized water. Even I was cleaning the patient with the oxidized water, mopping the floor with the oxidized water. And uh, I will not say that uh, how much percentage is cut the infection rate and other things, but certainly as I, I was observing that it was quite effective, and it is cheap also. Okay, this is not in my knowledge, sir. May I will certainly ask water. in my hmm. microbiology people yeah. about that. H two O two water. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, two O two water. Okay. And um, moreover, the like this market product. They come yes. and uh, solicit that uh, T two twenty five is very effective. We believe and we start using, one, but definitely they are very expensive. Yes. Some of the hospital cannot afford. Naturally, we M S can afford, but the other hospital cannot afford. That's but I K R in the even in the small hospital is very very important. Yes, yes. And I, I will request the like uh, you are sitting in M S and the other professors are senior professors. We must yes. give a clear cut guideline how to yes. clean the O T. Um, uh, with the point of protection of the other equipments, yes, carrying other <laughs> equipments. Certainly. We just say fumigation. Oh, sister, जो पुरानी है वो कहती है fumigation करना है खाली कर दीजिए और एक वो ला करके fumigate के नाम पर बंद कर देती हैं. Whether it is effective or not effective, how much is the damage? We really don't know. We screen भी आप fumigation के बाद जाइए तो monitors के screen भी बहुत मुश्किल होते हैं तो touch करना. ये इशू है बेसिकली एड्रेस करना है सभी को थैंक यू फॉर दिस ऑल इनपुट्स आई थिंक यू लुक फॉर वाटर अवेलेबल इन दर सोर्स इज नॉट वेरी लाइक टेक्निकली साउंड दैट मे बी ऑल्सो इन्फेक्टेड थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर एनलाइटिंग वॉट इज डॉक्टर रमन दीप्स ओपिनियन What is his experience? Uh, sir, uh, in PGI, uh, we have stopped fumigation for long time back hmm. because uh, it's clear if you have a positive pressure ventilation, there is no role of fumigation. Yeah. Point of fumigation arises from the small practices actually. So, hmm. but I totally agree with you. We should not use fumigation in this era. Uh, we should try to uh, because uh, uh, do uh, use other method. We are very uh, do uh, we we use carbolic acid a lot here. Uh, we uh, carbolization we ask them to do in between the infective cases but we are not using fumigation but, but that uh, even carbolic acid that damages the only tables yes. that damages yes. the everything absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. so we should uh, you are absolutely right we should find try to find a uh, new things which are less uh, damaging to the only instruments and everything yeah because we are demanding the modular ot Yeah. Um, uh, now the new surgeons are saying they will not operate unless they have the modular roti. Absolutely. <laughs> so we need a modular surgeons also. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an anesthetist, so just uh, excuse me for this comment. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Mitra.
Thank you, sir, for your uh, uh, nice, uh, you know, talk, and you have added something more into it, and uh, we all will uh, look into this matter also. Thank you, sir. So now I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Ramandeep Singh, sir, uh, who will who is professor and PGI at Chandigarh. The topic of uh, his uh, discussion is uh, post-operative atherosclerosis tips and tricks to early diagnosis. Thank Are my you. slides visible now, Dr. Nanda? Yeah. Yes, they are. I'm really, I'm really sorry for the, uh, you know, uh, it's okay, it's okay, sir. So, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I I'll thank uh, uh, Dr. D K Singh, the executive director uh, and CEO of Ames Bhutanda, and sir, uh, you, uh, as Dr. Nrada said, you must be a great inspiration. I really, I'm really enjoying the way you are, uh, you know, hearing us all and giving your uh, uh, relevant uh, inputs. And of course, your team, they have done a great work organizing this, uh, this uh, CME. Uh, in this era, actually, the sharing of knowledge is uh, very important, actually. So uh, you share knowledge, you present your work, and that's how you grow, actually. So this is very important, uh, you know, initiative uh, your team has taken. Uh, so my talk is on post-operative endothelitis and tips and tricks to the early, early diagnosis, because uh, uh, if you talk about site threatening ocular infections, uh, uh, the uh, the post operative endothelitis is very important and it is going to uh, remain there because we are surgeons and we will be operating uh, these patients. And I'll be uh, covering this as a history, some history of endothelitis, risk factors, symptom signs, and differentiate from tasks. And this is what uh, nobody wants to see actually. Uh, you can see this uh, newspaper article in the search of light, they ended up in darkness, actually. And this is what, uh, you know, happens if you get a, 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 a ocular infection after a, a, a routine elective surgery. And the history of this disease goes back to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, more than more than 100 years. And I came across this paper uh, where uh, uh, Dr. Harry Flynn uh, uh, very nicely elaborated and divided endothelitis into three eras. And the era one was 1918 to 40 when it was a pre um, antimicrobial era. People even used to use uh, intramuscular injections of uh, milk to treat endothelitis. And they used to apply heat to treat endothelitis. Then they used to do X-ray of the bleb to treat endothelitis. And, uh, and the later in 40s and 71, you know, because of the better asepsis and antimicrobials, the thing have approved. So uh, in the history, uh, every two patients out of 100 used to get endothelitis, but now the rate is something like three per 10,000. So things have gone down because of the better asepsis and newer and newer antimicrobials and our diagnostics have improved. But on the way, we have increased the number of causes also actually. So if you if you if you uh, if I talk about the what are the causes which are causing you know the GFS surgery because I've kept it at number one because it's a filtration surgery it's a filter uh, so lifetime risk of developing endothelitis is very high and uh, the cataract surgery is because we are a nation who is uh, we have avoidable blindness due to cataract and we are number two in the world in terms of blind people. And out of that, uh, 19, uh, 17, 18 million, we have 8.5 million who have cataract, which is a avoidable blindness. And if we operate them, the risk of endothelitis is there. So we have to imagine how much the risk is there. And the latest, the new thing is now we are giving these anti VEGF injections to treat our diabetic patients, treat our age related uh, macular degeneration. So it has, in fact, become the number one being done ophthalmic procedure it has left the cataract surgery behind now so you can imagine it all it can also lead to the end of thermitis any intervention in the eye and the last but the not the least the vitrectomy can also cause so why it is important to pick up this disease early why early diagnosis so this is i i highlighted in red that even when we are doing our best we are able to save only 40 percent of the people who will have a vision more than 20, 40, once he get endothermitis. So he, uh, so much is the risk. So why early diagnosis is missed? Because there is a delay in the diagnosis. I'll tell you why. And once you delay the diagnosis, then the, there are complications like cornea will get involved. You will have permanent media opacities. You will have membranes in the anterior chamber. 
you will have membranes over the iols you have membranes behind the iols and above all once you have toxins in the eye which are produced by your bacteria the fungus and they are causing damage to the optic nerve they are causing permanent damage to the optic nerve and to the macula and eventually these people will never see a uh, good in these eyes and the 8% of the, these people will develop eventually a retinal detachment even if you treat or not treat them so that is why it is important to diagnose these patients early so that you can if you can prevent this and it is important once i say early recognition what will happen with the early recognition either you will refer it if you have not the capability of uh, treating uh, this end of the matter is yourself or in your team and or the early referral will lead to early treatment so this is a three e's which are keys to the success here the delay why the delay happens i the first and the red highlighted case not believing that it can happen to you this is the first surgeon says oh it cannot happen to me all right this is the first and foremost cause of the delay in the diagnosis because we don't want to believe it and then we are missing some clinical signs there i'll tell you and then we don't have a knowledge of the spectrum we are looking at the west we have not uh, found out that what is happening in my country my place north india south india east west so we should be knowing that what are the spectrum of organism which are happening in our population so that we treat them early all right and again i said we there is an entity called tas the toxic anterior segment reaction you know this is always comes to my mind this is not end of the matter this is tas so we are not able to differentiate it and we delay delay for 24 hours 48 hours and losing that time and delay in the diagnosis of us not believing i come to this point now i come to this point more elaborately always know your handicap what, what what i mean is you are the surgeon you know that if i operate this patient what kind of inflammation on day one i will have you have operated the patient you have manipulated the iris you have took longer time for the surgery you know that next time how much reaction will i have so this is what is know your handicap what you have done in the that this is going to come on the next day the so next day rather than saying is endothelial mitosis or rather than saying is it's normal we should know why it has happened so not believing it can happen to you why because it can happen to anybody it can happen to a patient who is a diabetic because the risk factors are there this patient had blepharitis or bad ocular surface and this patient has a immunocompromised status so they have more chances of developing the post operative infection and of course you remember once you have a pcr once you have a vitreous loss and wound leak the your surgery time will increase and again you have made the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber one chamber the chances of infection increases and above all you have not sutured it and you have not taken care of everything so these are the patients who will have more chances of developing more inflammation or maybe end of the matter later and of course on the day one you missed a post operative wound leak because you didn't check the pressure there you just saw the anterior chamber you said patient is fine so these are the things that you have to know that always suspect always you know challenge yourself that why this patient is suddenly gone bad already why this patient is not seen so our target should be making the patient 66 and in that you know 66 what is coming in between that if you know that only then you let the patient go home by symptoms and sign i means that this this patient now you have operated now this patient will have si some signs you know patients will have some symptoms so the pain redness and you know matting of lids and decreased vision these we all have been taught all this so how to use this information for the patient care that is that is more important so patient comes with a pain redness congestion is there lids are swollen so we have read it theoretically the how to use it so this is what i i, I always tell my post graduates and wherever cataract surgeons accumulation that what you should do when you operate any of these patient you should follow some good clinical practice this is very important for a single practitioner also and for the you know multiple ophthalmologist practice is very important suppose you have done a surgery and your P, you have gone home and you are not able to see the patient next day so your pg or your co colleague should follow these if 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 they are re recording vision iop incision site information anterior chamber and posterior chamber media clarity on every visit they will never miss a diagnosis of endophthalmitis so 
it should be a good clinical practice. I'll go one by one again. So if you have a patient who's pre-op visual acuity unaided and pinhole, you have you know that. And post-operatively, you have you have to do it again. We have to that Dr. Mittal said you have to see them first 24 hours on uh, all these patients. So you should know that what his vision will be likely. So why has suddenly he was six nine? Why he has become counted in the three meters? So maybe today he's six twelve. You know, on day one the, uh, with pinhole, and day seven he comes. He is now six sixty. So your antenna should be up. So if somebody has not recorded the vision properly on that day and not writing that, writing that it's unaided or with pinhole, so you will miss the you know uh, follow up unless until you are yourself seeing that. But this is not a good practice. You should not keep things in your brain. You should put them jot down in, on the paper. What was the pinhole vision? And day seven you see pinhole vision is six six better. So that means the things are good. All right. If the vision has gone down. Your antenna should be up. It's a red flag there. What about IOP? So this patient on day one, the patient has a high IOP. Patient suddenly has a high, high IOP, or it's a low IOP. Low IOP will you will look for a you know a leak there. You put a sutures there. This patient had a, a you know PCR and the, a leaky wound. As you all know, hypotony, a low pressure, high pressure to low pressure. Things will move from the conjunctival sac into the eye. The chances of endophthalmitis are more. So you should not leave a leaky boot to always check the IOP. You will say, uh, I, I don't want to touch my patient on day one. No, you, you in any surgery, uh, you can check a pressure. This is just an excuse. You know, you, you can use NCT, you can do, use conventional applanation tonometry. So this will give you a lot of clue. You should not miss this information. And this should become your GCP. When I say section, here, I mean, you have to see the FACO sections also. If I'm doing vitrectomy, I'll see the three ports also. I will, if I've done G, GFS, any intraocular surgeon, I will see that area. So the, uh, uh, somebody sees, if you don't, uh, you know, you know, you have a, you made a 12 o'clock incision. So you have to lift the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, lid up and to see what is happening to the section so that you don't miss, uh, uh, miss a finding there. So section has to be seen. All right conjunctival, corneal, scleral, or any section you have given. Because if you don't retract the lid, you will never be able to pick up this corneal finding of a, the, 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 there, is a, uh, there, is a there is a tunnel infection there. So if, if somebody sees without lifting it and the patient, is, the patient goes home and you, so if somebody writes that section is normal, so next time you see a section is involved, so you know that this guy has seen it. So if somebody has not written a section there, he's written cornea clear and go home and next time patient comes with a corneal infiltrate, so probably that guy has not seen. So always put the negative findings out, the relevant negative findings, section, how is the section, is it leaky, is it, uh, you see infiltrate there, you see a fiber there, you see a corneal edema near the section, so you have to put down everything. If you don't put down, so this will not be a GCP there. Same in the anterior chamber, hypopion, nobody will miss. Nobody will miss fibrin in the eye. But thing is, how many times that you have retracted the lower lid to pick up a 0.3 or a one millimeter hypopion? So if somebody writes, you know, if today day one somebody says patient is six twelve, next time day seven patient comes with a six eighteen vision and a hypopion, and I go back and see somebody has written cells two plus flare two plus, no mention of hypopion. That means probably I'll think that probably this guy has missed it. So it's important to put a no hypopion initial one month you sh should do this gcp and if you don't do it then the second person may miss the finding and you will lose the chance of picking up a early diagnosis of endothelmitis because remember the endothelmitis can be a delayed presentation it may not present on day one or day two it can present at one week all right so first six weeks are the most crucial in case of acute endothelmitis same I said, retract the lower lid. Even if the cornea is clear, you see cells and flare, you don't uh, retract it. That uh, the, to document and no hypopion, the examination is not complete. Now again, every person, every in any every clinic, either you remember this this classification, or you or, or you put down a, a paper there because this is a classification given for uveitis, but it is used all over the world for endothelmitis also because. Once you use a nomenclature which is standardized, only then uh, if you are writing a four plus cells there, 
and next time you see two plus cells only then i'll be able to you know be at peace that the things have gone on a better term all right so day one if the reaction somebody has written four plus at day whenever you see at 48 hours or, or or one week you see two plus that means a good sign suppose on day one you have one plus cells and day four four plus cells. what is happening your again your antenna should be up so how will somebody know that if xyz has not put he has just put down ac quiet and uh you know uh the, the cornea clear no you have to write cell zero flare zero if you have written taken time to write that that means your examination is now complete i will believe you that you have seen it on that day so you should see it on day one you should see it on day seven and uh, one month evaluation so if you're seeing that one plus becoming two plus to three plus that means that four weeks so something is wrong with this patient is a chronic endothelmitis or something is happening so these are the clues that you should use a standardized classification to grade cells and this thing next is media clarity as a cataract surgeon you can't cannot ignore it you have to have a, a you know undilated through the undilated people see the media when we talk about media clarity must be given it is classification given to be used with the indirect but no we can't use it with the uh, the, the slit lamp microscopy with the 90d also the uh, if you are seeing a red glow or you're seeing able to see the vessels and all these things so this is how it is you know if you have put a day one that media is grade one and if day seven you suddenly see there's a yellow glow so that means something has gone wrong in between all right so you must document the what kind of a media the patient has so it is important from my side uh, just writing red glow and yellow glow is not sufficient you have to tell that what is happening and it can be done in the undilated people you don't have to unnecessarily you know dilate them every time so this is how we use these uh, in, in, in patients that this was a patient of a with, with the hypopion and uh, we operated this patient see the gradually the hypopion is going down the now the red glow is being seen so the patient is improving in terms of his hypopion has gone down his cornea has become clear and the glow has become red and now you are able to see of course the patient will have a improvement in the vision also same here you have a, a fibrin there no hypopion see after the surgery you can see fibrin but the iris is clear now now you will see uh, the iris the fibrin has retracted from one side and gradually it is retracting and fallen down so this is how the progression of the once you start treating endothelial matters is also seen and this is important in the diagnosis also and in the management also now my third thing was know your spectrum why it is important that we have been uh, you know it it, it, it was late in, in 1998 2000 when we i joined that there was a you know people said the ebs didn't see any uh, uh, what do you call fungal in their uh, infection the evs is endothelmitis vitrectomy study which was done in the west and we were following their guidelines to treat the uh, the endothelmitis patient because they did not have any fungal infections so we uh, uh, we in india did not believe the guidelines given by them so we added some own guideline also because we had a patient of fungal endothelmitis also because the fungal endothelmitis can also be the cause for them because like the sir was saying dr dk saying for them the environment is different they don't believe in fungus you know their fungus is for them for the developing countries or underdeveloped countries but yes their environment is much more cleaner they walk in with the shoes into their ors so many things are happening there but this is not possible here because we have a different environment patient hygiene that so many things are there so you have to remember that the fungal infection is also very important about the fungal the classical teaching was you know that it is delayed in onset if you read the classical teaching the fungal comes after six weeks with uh, the causes after endothelmitis uh, after six weeks are p acne and fungal this is what is written there so this paper by uh, pgi group in 2001 we elaborated that fungus can present in acutely also within 24 48 hours also all right and then they said the fungal is seen in the only the clusters if you have i mean 20 patients it is uh, you know two three patients will develop fungal single case will not no from that study we said it can occur as a single case also and then we were we were always taught that a convex hypopion fluff balls in the vitreous cavity shows fungal otherwise fungal is not there no fungus can present without this also fungus will present as a yellow glow also so you have to remember in a population of like india 
the fungal can be present on the day one. So you have to not, you know, give antibacterial. So you have to take a tap and get the grams and KOH and decide whether it's a fungal or, or a bacterial to start treatment of, of this patient. And once you know it, only then you will make a, you know, fast because fungal, fungal endothelmitis in the eye is a, is a problem there. All right. So now the next is toxic anterior segment syndrome. This is a very famous terminology used by the anterior segment surgeons because the, the day one they see a reaction, uh, they will say it's a probably a task. So, okay, it's a task, but always try to, uh, you know, uh, go back and think what have you done new in the OP? Whether you used yesterday, somebody gave you a, a viscoelastic to try, somebody gave you a, a, a bottle to try, or you used a new lens. So always try to find a cause for the task or whether you use a ETO instrument too early. So if you are not able to find a cause of the task, then think that it's a probably endothelmitis. I may be wrong. So I give you clues here. Now, this is, uh, I mean, this is a chart we find in the books. You know, uh, I believe in few things, not in all the things. But yes, task occurs within few hours, first uh, 24 hours. The task, uh, a, a, a day three, you see a patient and start calling is it a task? No. If you have seen the patient on day one, his anterior segment was uh, quiet, everything was fine. And day three, he develops a reaction. It is not TOS. All right. Suppose you have seen a patient at day three, you have not seen the patient at day one. It can be a TOS. All right. Because you have missed the TOS on day one. So endothelmitis can present on day one also or later also. So day two, day three, day four, don't call it a TOS. Okay. All right. But people said corneal edema. Corneal edema can be there in the endothelmitis depending on your surgery also. But what is different is TAS patients normally have a lot of iritis. They will have a lot of pain there. Their pupils will be dilated because of that. So if, if you see a dilated pupil, pain, increased IOP, and then, you know, you think of a task. So the greatest, the most valuable here is the, your ultrasonography. Because the ultrasonography is, you know, echoes are free in this patient. So if I go ahead and tell, perform USG at low gain and high gain then tell that it's a, whether the uterus is eco-free or not. All right. So this is what, you know, uh, uh, so, so once you've made a, a patient comes to you in the morning with a, you think it's a task. So what I always say is don't let the patient go home, make that patient sit in your OPD and give intensive steroid, which we used to give for the uveitis. Uh, the steroid drops for every one minute for five minutes, every five minutes for half an hour, then every half hour till the, till the time you're there. If you're there at five o'clock at the clinic, you see the patient at four o'clock, you will see the patient is improving or not. If patient is not improving, the reaction is not going, the, uh, the exudates have not come up, you know, give intravitreal and uh, refer it to the next patient, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, retina surgeon. If you are proficient in giving intravitreals, otherwise don't delay it till morning. All right. So, but you should do tap and inject that very evening. But if you are seeing improvement, the cornea clarity has gone down. Fibrin, so if you if you give half hourly steroid, your fibrin will start retracting, and you will be able to see the difference. And call the patient next morning, and then say it's a TAS or endothelitis. But by evening, you should know because you should not miss an opportunity to inject and tap because delay will cause a, a, a lot of uh, problem to the uh, to the patient. So this is my uh, uh, favorite saying that start giving these steroids very, very intensively and see the patient before you call it a day actually. So this is the one example, you know, as I've already said, as a surgeon, you know what kind of reaction you will get. So a surgeon got this kind of a reaction there. This is not even day one. This is day two that we missed getting photograph of this patient on day one. But see the fibrin has retracted because the, we found that the vitreous cavity was clear. The surgeon said I had some iris manipulation because we could not recall any uh, you know new thing or uh, reason for task, but we thought as an increased inflammation or a task and started the patient of intensive uh, topical steroid. And by morning he was like this. By day two he was like this. By, by day seven the, everything was fine. Now this one you remember the corneal edema. See the day one patient comes with a call. The patient comes with the corneal edema and the people is dilated. The surgeon has not done it. But gradually, once he's treated with the steroids and how the patient has responded uh, well to the treatment. But these are the very rosy pictures I've shown. But the picture, people have, you know, iris atrophy. People have fixed pupil after the task. So, uh, uh, so you have to remember that task can happen. But again, 
always try to differentiate it from the endothelmitis. Day one is very important for differentiating between TAS and the endothelmitis. So this is my last slide. Uh, any, because you are surgeons, you are going to operate these patients all your life. So if you don't have a GCP, like I've said, for the close monitoring of these post-operative patients, you will, one day you will have a problem there. And it should be a universal approach. Uh, at all the follow-ups, these things should be done. And again, once you have done that, either the patient will improve or the patient will be status quo or worsening. Depending on that, the patient you will keep the patient with yourself if you are a cataract surgeon. Otherwise, believe me, uh, this is again what I would use. These are hot potatoes. All right. So you don't keep a hot potato in your hand. So if you are a VR surgeon yourself, you will know what to do. But if you are not a VR surgeon, you will give that hot potato to your colleague who is friendly to you. Again, these are hot potatoes. And quickly shuffle these hot potatoes because you will burn your hands otherwise. Dr. Uh, Mittal has already <laughs> said that how will you burn your hands actually. So thank you so much. These are my references and thank you so much from... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ramandeep. Uh, this is really a very uh, treat to hear, listen to you. With your presentation is your, your, your really a final verdict. <laughs> <laughs> it's a final verdict. Speed to listen. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was very really good. Talk. Yes. It just slips into our neurons just like anything. Yeah. And, you know, we have been uh, fed uh, in the PGI with all these tips and tricks, but you have uh, rejuvenated all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ramadhi. I don't know. It's only me or um, I, I find uh, Dr. Amod Gupta speaking through him. <laughs> 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 so, yes, we all have his essence, but uh, um, um, his, essence. This is all his, his, his words, potatoes are his words, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is his, this is his, uh, you know, trademark, potato, hot potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great so, uh, then, um, even I uh, think, uh, I think then uh, this is he explained everything. There won't be any question after his talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Lavi can invite the next speaker. I think it's already time is becoming. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Shweta, want to say something? No, it's just a, a small comment yeah. I would like to make on uh, fungal uh, postoperative end. I share the view that yes. uh, you Please. can we can get uh, fungus within 24 to 48 hours of the presentation and. Um, I have dealt with the very um, bad uh, fungal endothelmitis. Uh, colleagues have had done a um, like you know massive. At uh, that time, there were cluster cases, and uh, uh, we actually proved it through microbiology samples, and uh, they turned out to be more. Uh, we don't find much of candida here. It's more of aspergillus, a uh, fumigators. I don't know if you uh, more of aspergillus. And I've also seen a cluster end of, uh, of fungal endothelmitis when I was working in Bangalore following the retina surgeries uh, grown from buccal samples, even if it was combined with the uh, intraoperative um, uh, vitrectomies or only RD surgeries from buccals, the black uh, molds were growing. And so it's, uh, it's that common. And uh, it was attributed to finally some construction happening nearby. So almost what Dr. Sanjeev had also said about the, we have to really take care of that construction part because the because of the spores that spread in there. Thank you. After Thank you, Dr. Shweta. Uh, let me uh, she is a private practitioner and she is VR surgeon. She is in Patinda only. And uh, she owns her own hospital and she is very good a colleague of mine. She is also an UNI of uh, PCI. Thank you, Dr. Shweta, for your uh, inputs. Now, I'll... Uh, I have one query one from uh, Ramanjit, sir. Uh, just simple. Uh, in cases of task, uh, you have told that uh, there will be pain. Uh, either on universal finding or uh, no, 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 no. pain is more in endothermitis. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this is not a, a universal finding. I've, I've already, uh, as I've already said, you know. So, in case of a lot of increased pressure and iritis, so you will you will have a lot of pain. But again, you have to take care of the other signs also. So, in TAS, you will not have a lid edema and lid mashing. All right. Endothelial matters. You have lid edema and mashing. So you have to. That, that's what I'm saying. I I see that table in the books, but. 
the which uh, things which really differentiate are on the day one presentation and the ultrasound otherwise the rest of the things are mixed matching you know hypopion can also be seen in the task but people say the hypopion is more common in endothelmitis so again the pain is there in the endothelmitis you have a corneal involvement you have a lot of pain not a, yes, so it's all you know mix and match but again you have to take care of all the symptoms not just go by one symptom another important uh, thing i got from your presentation is that in all the suspected cases of pas one should go for uh, usc b scan immediately absolutely that, that that is the that is the key and both at low gain and high gain you know if if you if you do it at too low gain sometimes you miss you know initial infection a little bit high gain and see what is happening there and always compare it with the other eye you know pas these patients are old patients some vitreous debris are there all right so uh, you will call vitreous debris uh, as exudates you know this is very common so you compare it with the other eye what is happening in the other eye the exudate should be almost similar the moment you see this exudate you do uh, end off you know you will be able to tell that is it a is it tas or is it a, a normal uh, finding of the ultrasound or is it is it endothelmitis and again i told you uh, in the morning also you do and before leaving the uh, in the evening also you do that, that those uh, six, seven hours are very important yeah Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One query I am also having, sir. Yeah. Uh, so there was a patient just two days back. Uh, he was on operated for uh, RD surgery approximately six months back. So suitable patient. He was uh, greenish hue and like it was kind of end of thalmitis presentation in an oil filled eye. So like, uh, how do we approach in such a case? because the oil was having uh, not quite much of emulsification but uh, yeah emulsification had started so it was a six month old surgery was done but the patient was uh, having uh, cells in the ac although oil was all uh, back behind the eye only but uh, behind uh, the eye there was all greenish hue and all the like fibers that like we see in the remaining vitreous kind of thing mm -hmm. Presentation like end of thalamus presenting in an oil field. I can. Like, how do we manage such kind of a case? Yes, sir. Uh, as Dr. Shweta said, I think you have to first check the, whether there is a buckle or the, uh, that inside the eye. The how is how are the surroundings? You know, I would look for a, a very any exposed buckle or exposed suture. First of all, if 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 that uh, is sir, there was no uh, uh, there was no uh, buckle in uh, that uh, case and. Uh, the pain also was congested and uh, i could see the limbal uh, congestion and and in the patient i i i think if if you are sure that it's a, it's a diagnosis of endothelmitis you know uh, you can try with the intravitreal first all right the we give uh, uh, one fourth the dose with the intravitreal and if it doesn't resolve with the intravitreal then you have to uh, go with the uh, oil removal and uh, do the complete surgery yeah and fill the eye with the oil again Right. So I mean, the intravitreal dose will uh, be reduced to one fourth. Obviously, obviously, uh, even even they say one fourth dose, and don't make the patient prone. Patient should lie on the uh, uh, side so that it doesn't concentrate in the macula. Actually, yeah, that is the main problem. Yeah. I have referred the patient to PGI only. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yes, you can call me any time for that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. So, any more questions? Uh, one more query, sir. Uh, regarding tapping, uh, many times, especially in pediatric cases, uh, there, there is dry trap. And uh, basically, the diagnosis is based on the microbiological examination. So, what uh, additional precaution or additional uh, uh, maneuver uh, instruments or cannulas should they use so that uh, tap, uh, every time one should get uh, uh, some. Uh, so, uh, sample I, for uh, every 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 one of us uh, one of us including me have faced this thing called dry tap we've all faced it actually so so don't worry about it so try to use uh, what is recommended what i say i mean if you follow the uh, the guidelines the west guidelines and india also same guidelines they they said use 25g needle and do a needle with a better suction use 3ml needle and 1 inch needle and this is what you use for the vitreous tap actually 25 gauge 1 inch and 3 ml and you should try to take tap with that 
and if you are not able to get anything from the, there, take AC tap. You know, uh, if there's there are cells in the AC, you, you should get uh, information from there also. But dry taps, yes, you get sometimes. I mean, you have to try again or AC tap. Yeah. So twenty five yeah. or twenty gold. Twenty five, twenty five. Shita. Two five. They will, won't that be very thin? I know, but <laughs> 20 is too thick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, or, I, mean, like, I use 26 gauge, but if it doesn't come, then yeah, a little 20, thick. 25, even 24 sometimes, but 20 G is too, too thick. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay. So moving on, uh, our not, last topic. Uh, is uh, antimicrobial agents used in ophthalmology and their resistance to be delivered by Dr. Munish Thavan. So uh, uh, I would like to invite him uh, once more. He's currently working as professor and head of department in Guru Gobind Singh Medical College, Faridkot, and he had done his post-graduation and senior residency from Ames, New Delhi. He has numerous index publications in various journals to his name. Uh, he has uh, uh, served as editors for two books, uh, Mastering Nucleotomy Techniques in Phaco Emulsification and JP uh, Video Atlas of Glaucoma Surgery. Besides, he has also co-authored uh, various chapters in uh, many books. Please, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. And uh, slides are also visible to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Radha and Department of Ophthalmology of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhatinda, to give, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And the, my topic for today is the antimicrobial agents in ophthalmology and their resistance. So uh, re regarding brief history, it was uh, around 1900 that concept of uh, uh, selective toxicity came. When they say that we can use some chemicals which can be selectively toxic to microorganisms with no toxicity to the host. It was in 1929 when Fleming observed that his agar plates contaminated with penicillin species were free of other bacteria, such as staphylococci, which led to the discovery of penicillin. In 1935, Domac discovered sulfonamide, which led to the winning of the Nobel Prize. And it was in the year 1940 when Chain and Flore used penicillin in the treatment of streptococcus pneumoniae, which was the turning point in the management of infectious diseases. Then, Streptomycin was discovered in late 1940s, leading to the discovery of tetracycline, no, no, no. chloramphenicol, and lincomycin. Uh, sir, uh, sorry to interrupt, but your your slides are not changing. It's stuck on no, the first no, no. slide. It is changing no, now or not? No, sir. Not changing? No, sir. Uh, it's changing on your screen? It's only, yeah, 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 now it's changing. It's changing. Not changing? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now uh, we have three antimicrobial agents available with us. One is antibacterial, antifungal, and antivirals. So uh, first we will discuss the antibacterial agents. They have been divided according to their mechanism of action. Group one includes that inhibit the synthesis of cell wall. Group two inhibits cell membrane function. Group three inhibit protein synthesis. And group four are those that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. So this is the uh, diagram which uh, covers the, all the groups of the antibacterial agents. Group 1 in, uh, is shown in the red uh, uh, which inhibits the cell wall synthesis. Group 2 uh, which includes penicillin, cephalosporins and carbapenems. Group 2 which indicates in the green is that uh, inhibit the cell membrane function. Group 4 is in the blue which inhibits the protein synthesis or uh, maybe on the 30S inhibitor on the ribosome or 50S inhibitors of the ribosome and group 5 which inhibits the synthesis of the nucleic acid. We will discuss in brief about these antimicrobial agents. Group 1 are those which inhibit the cell wall. These include beta lactams, penicillins and penicillins are further divided into four classes. One is the class 1 is the uh, penicillin uh, fourth generation. First generation is the penicillin G and penicillin is resistant penicillins. Second generation includes the amoxicillin and ampicillin. Th third generation is the carbenicillin and ticarcillin. Fourth generation is the mesolocillin and piperacillin. And monobactams includes imipenem and carbipenems. 
cephalosporins we are using uh, very frequently nowadays we have four, five generation of cephalosporins first generation is cefazolin which is more active against gram positive organisms second generation is ceferoxine which has also been used intracamerally and it has no activity against pseudomonas third generation is ceftazidime uh, which is more active against gram negative bacteria and fourth and fifth generation we are not using in ophthalmology and uh, these include targosir or ticopramin so uh, group one is uh, that inhibit cell wall synthesis and bacterial survival is compromised without a cell wall and the thickness of the bacterial cell wall varies gram positive bacteria have thick cell wall and gram negative bacteria has thin cell wall as you can see in this diagram so gram positive bacteria are more susceptible to the group one antimicrobial agents which inhibit the cell wall synthesis a second group is the that uh, which inhibits the cell membrane function it includes imidazoles polyenes and daptomycins in polyenes we have amphotericin b which we use in ophthalmology imidazoles we use azoles so imidazoles inhibits the ergosterol synthesis leading to disruption of the cell membrane function and polyenes binds to the ergosterol in the cell membrane of the fungus and the last is the daptomycin which is binds to the bacterial cell membrane leading to depolarization and loss of membrane function amphotericin b and polyenes are more active against the fungus because uh, and they do not have affect bacterial cell membranes daptomycin is a new lipopeptide antibiotic which use which is used for resistant gram positive organisms now coming to the group 3 which inhibits protein synthesis tetracyclines and aminoglycosides come in the group 3 because they bind to the 30s portion of the bacterial ribosomes and chloramphenicols lincomycin and macrolides bind to the 50s portion of the bacterial ribosomes out of these the drugs which are being used frequently in ophthalmology is the topical chloramphenicol to treat the ocular surface infections this topical chloramphenicol has very narrow spectrum and many organisms are resistant to it vancomycin is used in the resistant strains azithromycin is more active against chlamydia and gram positive bacteria lenazolid is the new antibiotic which is most active against gram positive bacteria and vancomycin resistant enterococci and mrsa so as you can see the group 4 are uh, the anti uh, in group 4 uh, is the classification given to the antimicrobial drugs which inhibits the nucleic acid synthesis uh, for uh, dna superprolyling is essential for the survival of the for the survival and formation of the dna the group 4 includes fluoro fluoroquinolones as you can see here these quinolones are bind to the topo isomerase enzyme this topo isomerase enzyme is essential for the transcription and transformation of the dna fluoroquinolones bind to these topo isomerases and they cause denaturation of these enzymes leading to the cell death so group 4 includes the drugs which inhibits the nucleic acid synthesis and these uh, quinolones come in this category which are used most widely in ophthalmology fourth generation of quinolones are available first generation is nalidixic acid which is mainly against gram which is gram negative coverage second generation is the norfloxacin which was the first topical fluoroquinolone uh, available which has extended gram negative coverage gadifloxacin is third generation fourth is moxifloxacin and bezifloxacin which maintained gram negative coverage and improved their efficacy on the gram positive also so uh, coming to the antifungal drugs antifungal drugs are divided into azoles echinocandines and polyenes polyenes are amphotericin b and nystatin azoles are fluconazole boriconazole posaconazole itraconazole which we generally use in our day to day practice as you can see in this uh, picture mechanism of action of antifungal drugs polyenes bind uh, lead, uh, polyenes lead to cell membrane depth uh, death uh, dysfunction of the cell membrane by binding to the uh, formation of the pores with which they enter the cell and cause the cell membrane dysfunction and this uh, azoles uh, block the conversion of the lenosterol to ergosterol by blocking the enzyme leading to the cell membrane dysfunction so uh, this is this was the brief about the antibacterial and antifungal drugs now coming to the antiviral drugs antiviral drugs are broadly being categorized into anti retroviral and anti non retroviral drugs in ophthalmology generally you will use anti herpes virus drugs so anti herpes virus drugs are acyclovir gancyclovir which act by uh, inhibition of the dna synthesis by conversion into their active molecule of triphosphate they inhibit the synthesis of dna leading to the cell death so newer antimicrobials are also available in the antibacterial category they are linezolid and streptogramin in antifungals category we have voriconazole posaconazole rivuconazole caspofungin in antiviral category we have valacyclovir valgancyclovir and fancyclovir 
So coming to the indications for which we use antimicrobials in ophthalmology. Antimicrobial indications are range from the uh, uh, blepharitis, conjunctivitis to the uh, vision uh, threatening endophthalmitis and orbital cellulitis as Dr. Raman has explained very nicely. So how to select an antibiotic? Whenever we feel that we need to start an, we need to give an antibiotic. There are so many questions in our brain. There are so many different types and generation of antibiotics available to us. It's important to identify those which are useful in ophthalmology and those which are not useful in ophthalmology. Now how to select? The initial selection of antibiotics for the treatment of ocular infections is based upon the most frequently encountered organism. As Dr. Raman has very clearly pointed out that in our area, in our place, we have to uh, uh, know that which organism is more prevalent. And second is the pharmacokinetics of the antibiotic. Third is the dosage and fourth is the cost which should be taken care uh, into account because most of the time we think that um, more expensive drugs are more effective. Uh, but sometimes it happens that less expensive drug is more active against that particular organism. So uh, Regis et al has uh, done one study in which they have found out that which organism is there in different types of ocular infections. So they have found out that Staphylococcus, uh, they have found out that Coagulase negative Staphylococcus was the most common bacterial isolated from cases of endophthalmitis and gram positive was more common as compared to the gram negative. Similarly, they have isolated the uh, samples of keratitis and found out that Staph aureus was more common followed by the Pseudomonas, Coagulase negative Staphylococcus and Staphylococcus viridens. And similarly, in cases of blepharitis, they have found out that Staphylococcus aureus is more common followed by the uh, Coagulase negative Staphylococcus and Streptococcus pneumoniae. So if we have found out the most uh, uh, organism, we have found out that organism which has caused that particular infection, now we can select the antibiotic. If it is the gram positive cocci, we can use the group of the cefazolin or vancomycin. If it is the gram negative, we can choose from tobramycin, septazidine group or fluoroquinolones group. If we think that it can be caused by both the types of these organisms, we can use combination of cefazolin and tobramycin. And if the, we think that it is mycobacteria and then azithromycin is very active, very effective against the mycobacterial group. Regarding antifungals, we use generally amphotericin B, which is a broad spectrum fungicidal resistance is very rare. It is available in the topical, subconjunctival and intravitreal dosage. Liposomal amphotericin B, we have, everybody has used in cases of mucormycosis. Azoles are available to us with as fluconazole, itraconazole, ketoconazole. These are broad spectrum and fungistatic against yeast and invasive candidiasis and filamentous fungi. Antiviral therapy which are available to us for treating cases of ocular infection is the acyclovir and gancyclovir. So uh, acyclovir ointment is available, gancyclovir ointment is available. Recently people are more using gancyclovir because it is more uh, harmful to the uh, virus as com and uh, having more spectrum of disease with less host toxicity. Now coming to the pharmacokinetics, how does a drug get inside the eye? There are two mechanisms by, by which drug can get inside the eye, by the blood retinal barrier as everybody knows and by penetration from the cornea mainly by the epithelium and endothelium of the cornea. When we put a drop inside the eye, it goes into the cul-de-sac and tear film compartment. Less than 5% of the drug reaches the intraocular tissues. Drug Then drug permeates molecule um, through the corneal epithelium and by the transcellular and paracellular pathways, it reaches the aqueous humor and further being distributed to the iris and ciliary body. So now this we, uh, everyone of us knows that uh, if we want to deliver drug in the anterior segment, we can have topical and subconjunctival route. If we want to deliver a drug into the posterior segment, we can use subtenon, intravitreal, peribulbar or retrobulbar routes. So uh, Tabra et al has uh, formed some guidelines for the proper use of antibiotics for ocular infections. So we should follow, we should try to follow these guidelines whenever possible. The use of antimicrobial should be initiated when patient has microbial infection and organism is susceptible to the antibiotic prescribed and the patient history and eye examination is consistent with the diagnosis of microbial infection. Ocular specimen should always be obtained before the initiation of therapy and etiological organism identified. But it is not possible all the time. So in serious infections, treatment can be started empirically before laboratory results. And the selection of antibiotic depends upon the susceptibility of the organisms 
adverse effects should be taken into account whether it is autotoxicity nephrotoxicity or hepatotoxicity whenever you find any adverse effect of the antimicrobial agent it should be discontinued then penetration into the affected tissue should be taken care of and cost is also very important so whenever there is discrepancies between the results of the laboratory sensitivity test and the patient clinical response that should be carefully carefully evaluated adverse effect should be taken into account always blood level should monitoring of the systemic antibiotic should be done if necessary duration of therapy depends upon the nature and site of the infection it, it should be given at least for one week the route of antibiotics depends upon the penetration of the antibiotic into the desirable infected site with its safe margin and shortest period of time to eradicate the offending agent so we have to choose the route whether we want to use it topically we want to give it intracamerally we want to give intravitrally or systemically and the possibility of a super infection should also always be taken care of should always uh, antibiotic combination should be avoided unless the organism has not been cultured antibiotic prophylaxis if it has to be used in surgery should cover both gram negative and gram positive organism and it should be started just before surgery long term use of antibiotic should always be avoided to avoid the to uh, resistance of the organisms sometimes we have to use antibiotics in combination these are some indications in which we can use these antibiotics in combination when the, there is severe vision devastating uh, vision threatening condition is there or infection is caused by more than one organism or there is emergence of resistant strains of the bacteria during the treatment or sometimes we encounter some uh, these uh, microorganisms like toxoplasmas and acanthamoeba which are sensitive, which respond to more than uh, use, uh, one antibiotic and when organism is not cultured and the clinical findings are highly suggestive of infectious etiology the great stumbling blocks to be safe and effective antibiotic therapy are resistance and toxicity which we face in our day to day practice antimicrobial sensitivity as we all know mic is the lowest concentration of an antimicrobial needed to halt the microbial growth it is expressed as mic 90 the concentration of antibiotic needed to inhibit 90% of the bacterial isolate now what is antimicrobial resistance antimicrobial resistance is the term used when bacteria viruses fungi and parasites they change over time now they are no long, no longer respond to the medicines to make making infections harder to treat and increasing the risk of disease spread leading to severe illness and death so uh, there was growing international concern about the antimicrobial resistance which has led to the increased emphasis on antimicrobial stewardship this is a strategy which promotes judicious use of antibiotics to preserve their future efficacy so uh, to know about the antimicrobial resistance we must know what is resistance and what is persistence whenever we have given antimicrobial uh, drug to the organism there can be two uh, um, scenarios one is that or, uh, some organisms are resistant to that particular agent they have developed resistance and these will not be killed if these will not be killed they will be survived and then then they will be regrown or resistant cells will be there so this is resistance persistence is that there are uh, microorganisms are not Uh, they have not resistant to that particular antimicrobial agent but they are in a dormant state so susceptible cells are killed but these cells are not killed but when they are regrown then again new growth is still sensitive to that antimicrobial agent when that uh, dormant bacteria uh, comes into a non dormant state so resistance can be natural or acquired so natural acquired and uh, natural resistance can be intrinsic or it is induced intrinsic is that it is always present in that particular species because of their intrinsic mechanism induced is when it is expressed only after exposure to that antimicrobial agent so acquired comes by the chromosomal mutations or by genetic material acquired by by the bacteria by transformation transposition or conjugation so some of the, these are the some factors which contribute to the growing resistance problem in our society that is increased consumption of these antimicrobial agents improper prescribing of these antimicrobial agents and prior use of these antimicrobial drugs which increases risk of infection with a drug resistant organism so coming uh, now we will discuss some mechanism of antimicrobial resistance how a bacteria develops the resistance so antimicrobial resistance mechanisms fall into four major categories one is the limiting uptake of the drug that bacteria will not limit will not uptake the, that drug and uh, less amount of drug will now enter into the bacteria they can modify the drug target or inactivating a drug and active drug efflux we will discuss these one by one 
So in this diagram, you can see that these are the four mechanisms by, by which antimicrobial resistance can develop by a microorganism. One is that there can be drug limiting uptake of a drug. Second is that modification of the drug target. Third is that drug can be inactivated by the bacteria. Fourth is that there can be development or of the efflux pump so that drug is thrown out of the bacteria. So by these four mechanisms and bacteria or any microorganism can develop antimicrobial resistance. So uh, uh, drug uptake can be, uh, uh, limiting drug uptake can be intrinsic or acquired. In intrinsic, like the structure of the LPS layer in gram-negative bacteria is barrier to certain types of molecules. So this is the intrinsic mechanism by which this um, uh, gram-negative bacteria are resistant to that particular antimicrobial drugs. And bacteria that lack a cell wall, such as mycoplasma. So mycoplasma will not, are intrinsically resistant to all the drugs that target the cell wall. So this is the intrinsic mechanism by which a drug cannot enter the, in, into the microorganism. So they, this mechanism can also be acquired by the, uh, there are porine channels in gram-negative bacteria, which are, which is give access to the hydrophilic molecules. So drug uptake can be limited by decrease in the number of porine channels or by mutations that change the selectivity of these porine channels. So less amount of drug will enter now into the microorganism, making it less effective. Or there can be the formation of the biofilm around the bacteria. So this is a film which formed, which can form around the bacteria by some sort of mutation, which prevents the, and uh, which protects the bacteria from the antimicrobial agents. So now much higher concentration of the drug is required to penetrate into that microorganism. By the, uh, uh, this is a type of acquired mechanism uh, by the bacteria, uh, microorganism. So second mechanism is the modification of drug target. So drug target can be modified in different ways by alterations in the structure or number of penicillin binding proteins, by changes in the structure of peptidoglycan precursors or by modification in DNA topoisomerase 4. So by these modifications, like a gram-positive bacteria acquire the GR1A gene, which cause decreased binding of the fluoroquinolones. By this mechanism, they can be more, become more resistant to the particular agent. Third mechanism is the drug inactivation. Now, drug can be inactivated by any bacteria, by actual degradation of the drug, by the production of beta-lactamase enzyme, this is hydrolyzing enzyme, which, which cause the drug to be inactivated, or by transfer of a chemical group out to the drug. Chemical group can be acetyl group, phosphoryl group, or adenyl group. Fourth mechanism is the efflux, drug efflux. So bacteria possess chromosomally encoded genes for efflux pumps with that can be expressed constitutively or that can be induced or over expressed under st certain stimuli uh, or uh, exposure to the antimicrobial agents. So these efflux pumps are primarily to read the bacterial cell of toxic substances. So there are five families of these efflux pumps and there are multi-drug efflux pumps are all, and can also develop in the bacteria with the passage of time leading to the antimicrobial resistance. So antimicrobial uh, resistance in ophthalmology is also very common. So WHO along with, uh, with the other agencies, they have uh, started a surveillance program to uh, know about the resistance patterns in uh, uh, ophthalmology conditions. Two such initiatives are of particular interest to ophthalmology. One is the ocular tracking response in the US today, that is trust. Second is the antibiotics resistant monitoring in ocular microorganism armor. So these are the trust and armor studies, which are the landmark studies which is being done in relation to ophthalmology. Uh, so these are the nationwide US based multi center surveillance program established in 1986. So these are surveillance studies which are aimed to look at prevalence of ocular antibiotics and their resistance and monitoring the susceptibility patterns of ocular isolates over a period of time. They tracked the changes in microbial culture results and they found out the susceptibility profile patterns of ocular antibiotics over the period of time. The trust study looks specifically at three microorganisms, Staph aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae. Similarly, armor study has been done. They have extended data collected from trust studies with the analysis of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Cobalis negative Staphylococcus aureus. They have published their results in two parts. One is 2009 and one was uh, done through 2013. So in this study, in the, the both of their studies, they have found out that over the period of time, as you can see here, that Streptococcus pneumoniae has become resistant to 
ऑलमोस्ट थर्टी फोर परसेंट केसेज ऑफ पेनिसलिन एंड एजिथ्रोमाइसिन एंड बट दे हैव लेस लेस रेजिस्टेंट टू मॉक्सीफ्लॉक्सिन सिमिलर इज दी फॉर दी अदर बैक्टीरिया लाइक मैथेजिलिन सेंसिटिव सेफेलोकोकस और Yes, and methods in resistance to Staphylococcus aureus. So they, over the period of time in these studies, they have found out that these bacteria have become resistant to these antibiotics. Uh, similar is for the methylene sensitive coagulase negative Staphylococcus and methylene resistant coagulase negative Staphylococci. Over the period of time, they have become resistant to the uh, these antibiotics. So they have concluded that. Step, uh, there are uh, there were no statistically uh, different st statistically significant changes to fluoroquinolone susceptibility over the study period in cases of streptococcus pneumoniae whereas methicillin sensitive staph staphylococcus aureus isolates were found to be susceptible to fluoroquinolones which is contrasted by the 75 to 85% resistance against fluoroquinolones tested in mrsa isolates similar is case for hemophilus influenzae it is susceptible to penicillin and all other antibiotics tested with the exception of 14.3% resistance to trimethoprim. Hence, they have found out that there is increasing resistance to all antibiotics over the time period, especially of Pseudomonas and MRSA. For, uh, to counter this, we are using moxifloxacin right and left in our day-to-day -day practice. So, the uh, increased resistance to other these fluoroquinolones has also started. Now they have uh, some uh, studies have come up that levofloxacin 1.5% have been introduced as a newer effective treatment modality in 2016. It is preservative free, broad spectrum, having uh, concentration is dependent upon fluoroquinil fluoroquinolone concentration dependent is effective on pseudomonas and staph aureus. No emergent side effects are seen with the, when we use this concentration of levofloxacin. After this, we should follow some practices that there can be less prevalence of antimicrobial resistance. We should not use antibiotic in sub-therapeutic dosage because using too low a dose exposes the microbes to the drug without killing them, leading to development of resistance, multiplication and their spread. And we should not use these antibiotics for short duration of treatment. We should use the right antibiotic. We should use the antibiotic only when proven to provide benefit and we should avoid using antibiotic in uh, viral keratitis uh, like as we frequently see on our daily OPDs. We should use alternative to antibiotics like covidine iodine or chlorhexidine. These are the two major antiseptics of choice in ophthalmology. So microbial resistance, to conclude, microbial resistance is an important subject with much innovation and research in prevention, detection and treatment of resistant bacteria. Unfortunately for ophthalmologists, most of this research is focused on systemic infection and it will take some time before diagnostic and preventive methods are viable in ophthalmology. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Munish. A very elaborative talk, very, very informative. Uh, for ca after post-operative uh, cataract surgery or glaucoma surgery, what, what do you recommend like uh, for how long the topical antibiotic should be continued? <coughs> Was I audible? Yeah, up audible, sir. Manish ki was nyari. Dr. Manish, sir, please unmute yourself. I think you are mute. <clears throat> you are not audible. No. No problem. Dr. Ramandeep can uh, Dr. Ramandeep can uh, <clears throat> Sir, I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the I because in India, uh, it's, it's, it's your individual decision, that's right. But considering our uh, population, I think pre-op and post-op antibiotics does have a role, apart from the poverty and iodine. And regarding the intracameral, I am uh, 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 very skeptical. Uh, Vanco, Cephuriaxam, and Moxifloxacin, they have used. Uh, because uh, the commercial preparations are not available, there are problems with the dilution and all. But in our population, whatever West may say, pre-operative and post-operative topical has to be given. Manish, I think you can add something. Yeah. Sir, so I, Manish, I, 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 yes, am Manish. I audible to you, sir? Yes, yeah. you are audible now. You are audible now. Yes, please. Sir. Uh, sir, I I want to ask one question from Dr. Ramandeep actually. Yeah. So I, uh, <laughs> because, uh, sir, uh, 
in our place we we are using these post operative antibodies at least for one month and we are using broad spectrum antibodies uh, most commonly used is the moxifloxacin that's right in years i am using intracameral antibiotic uh, in the form of vivamox so uh, but one question just uh, what was in my mind that i was going through the literature and there are so many studies which have been done they say that we should not use the pre operative antibiotic which uh, uh, that can lead to antibiotic resistance so that was the question which was coming to my mind that we should stop using the we, because in our uh, generally uh, from the last uh, uh, whatever days from our uh, post graduation we were we have seen and everybody is uh, using also pre operative antibiotics but now literature is coming that we should stop using pre operative antibiotics it is leading to more antibiotic resistance is it right sir uh see uh, manish uh, i mean if uh, how how i take it is there are uh, various factors there actually uh, where are you practicing in which country in which continent again those things are very 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 important uh, kind of patients we treat kind of hygiene they have exactly yes we know that drugs because if 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 i uh, if, if if i use moxifloxacin and i uh, some uh, some some uh, uh, sometime now they come with the another you know uh, the getting flox was there so people starting using that, that so you should not change it to the higher version this is what i believe in you know you should try to uh, keep them safe for some in advantage uh, uh, period so that i believe so you have to use a antibiotic in your which is uh prevalent uh, to organism in your population uh, 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 but uh, saying that i will not uh, use this thing i think it's too much of uh, you know asking for yourself and uh, they, they can be trouble yeah. but yes the antibiotic resistance is there if you use them you know unnecessarily and use them before their time comes mm -hmm. this is what i how i take it yeah definitely sir definitely dr metal uh, sir we want to add something <laughs> no, the no, same thing. Actually, I fully agree with that. Although with the AIS guidelines, <clears throat> as Dr. Manish also mentioned about pre-operative, but uh, still we give at least for one day. <clears throat> actually, what happens? Some uh, several times we are giving antibiotics pre-operatively for longer duration. So that uh, that is not not required actually. Yeah. So one day, I think uh, there is no harm. Maybe. And that uh, like depends upon you, like your OT status, your people around you, their hygiene condition. in the area where you are so all those that depend upon that and although there are some studies like uh, they give antibiotics for just for one week or two weeks i mean uh, <laughs> we feel comfortable practically giving like our some colleagues they give just for 10 days but we feel comfortable mostly that uh, you at least give for four weeks yeah and we are that. also giving for using for four weeks sir four weeks sir. yes now well, some studies are actually there na like give for for eight days is enough and when you are doing phaco surgery or sics phaco surgery is a closed chamber surgery there is no need of giving for more than 8 days but it's better to give like in an indian scenario it's, it's same for the it is same for the intravitreal antibodies also sir uh, i mean yes. sorry intravitreal anti vegfs yes, <laughs> yes yes so much of confusion <laughs> there actually so yes, yes, yes. Give, but we give it for 5 days that is yes. the same day and the 5 days that's it for the intravitreal antibodies also uh, we do give uh, for 5 days yeah one thing is more if we are giving uh, these antibiotics uh, um, 10 days before they are uh, insult to the corneal epithelium also because yes. they have toxic yes. preservatives also so corneal will also get uh, some kind of insult <clears throat> so it should be yeah. given one or two days before but uh, yes keeping other risk factors like diabetic patient and immunocompromised there we can uh, you mix and match and we can uh, think of all these things but uh, yes uh, only one or two days before it should be started and dr nurada i want to share one thing uh, from like uh, what we practice we do for our residents as well uh, like my colleagues also they all emphasize uh, the patients other than uh, cat intraocular surgery yes. the other patient coming to the opd they don't prescribe moxifloxacin to them okay so unnecessarily why are you creating resistance So give them some other other spectrum of antibiotics. Don't give moxifloxacin because normally for cataract surgery, mostly we are giving cataract glaucoma surgery moxifloxacin. So give them some other antibiotics. This all of our colleagues they emphasize on residents. So which one you prescribe, sir? See, see that actually varies. Either just we give the same group ciprofloxacin we can give, we oh. give ciprofloxacin, or we just give cromphenicol or combination policy depending upon that. 
or getty fluoxacin like depending upon like uh, the, you, you want to give oh. moxy fluoxacin avoiding okay so because of resistance factors that, that's just unnecessary because then it becomes a practice everyone all the residents they are writing all moxy fluoxacin for everyone a patient has come just little conjunctivitis everyone is giving moxy fluoxacin yeah that is true yes yes that should be avoided good practice sir uh, is there any uh, benefit of uh, using gatti fluoxacin uh, as a, it is uh, basically uh, orally it is banned uh, so topical gatti fluoxacin has uh, better viability or like that <clears throat> dr munish would you give your comments Gatifloxacin uh, is not banned. It is uh, and it is a not no toxicity is there. We are using for quite a long time. Even in fact, as you say, na uh, that moxifloxacin is being avoided. So uh, in our uh, this uh, department, we use gatifloxacin as preoperative antibiotic only. Yeah, yeah, that is that is what uh, I am emphasizing. As uh, orally, uh, its use is almost banned. So. Uh, uh, chances of resistance is less uh, uh, when uh, we, uh, we are using gatifloxacin. Maybe it is just hypothetical. Actually, if the overuse is not there, improper use is not there, it is not being used for a quite a long time, then chances of resistance of de to develop, uh, chances of developing resistance is less for that molecule. So uh, I think we can, we, sh we can use gatifloxacin or topically. So, any questions or query in the uh, chat box? The chat box is uh, empty. So, no questions. All talks are justified and everything is understood. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think uh, the lunch is also required now. <laughs> no questions now. The lunch are. People are getting happy. <laughs> okay, so over to <laughs> Doctor Lavi, you can. Okay, so uh, we can wind our CME with the, the vote of thanks. By Dr. Shushant. Uh, thank you, Dr. Munish. It was a wonderful talk. And uh, yes, it was comparatively a dry topic. And he called me up yesterday and said, Ma'am, you have made me <laughs> revise all those uh, pharmacology books. <laughs> and I have revised all those. And thank you for, uh, you know, for preparing your topic on a very short notice. Thank you. And you have done a wonderful job. Thank you. No, it was a very nice uh, topic and very relevant, actually. Yes. yes, actually relevant, but it is mostly, uh, uh, you know, neglected thing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why we wanted to talk on this also. So over to you, Dr. Lavi, now. So uh, it is time for a vote of thanks. And uh, Dr. Sushant Madan, he is a senior resident in our department. Uh, he'll be giving a vote of thanks to all of the participants, chairpersons, and uh, our eminent speakers. Over to you, Dr. Sushant. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you is such a prayer that cannot be seen or touched. It must be felt by heart. I Opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion. I would like to thank all the honorable delegates who blessed us with their presence today. Words are just not enough to thank their constant guidance and support of this conference. And with my deep regards and hearty thanks to our honorable director, Dr. D.K. Singh, Sir, Dean, Dr. Satish Gupta, Sir, and Medical Superintendent, Dr. Anil Goyal, Sir, who gave us the chance to organize this event. I'm also very thankful to Dr. Lajja Goyal, ma'am, for promoting the academic CMEs here in Ames, Bhatinda. They supported us in all possible manner to organize this meet. My special thanks to the chairpersons for the academic meet, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Mittal and Dr. Ramandeep, sir, for their gracious presence. 
at this juncture i will also i would also like to thank our eminent speakers dr munish dhawan sir dr anupam ma'am dr amit raj sir for their revitalizing talks today my words are just not enough to express the gratitude to our honorable hod ma'am dr anuradha raj ma'am whose brainchild idea helped us to get together for this cme via virtual mode i'm also very thankful to dr sanjeev sir for his cooperation in organizing this event i'm very much thankful to my colleague dr lavi mangla and all the non teaching staff members who have always stood with us an event of this dimension cannot happen overnight the wheels start rolling well in advance lastly thanks to the audience today for staying with us patiently hope it would have been an enlightening event for all of us today thanks to all of you for making this event really successful have a wonderful day we hope to meet again in near future with some similar event or better a physical one stay safe and wish all a happy healthy life thank you okay dr anuradha thank you and sabko namaste thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much sir thank you dr anuradha thank you sir thank you thank you sir nice sir see me dr anuradha thank you thank you thank you thank you sir bye bye we hope we'll uh, meet on a uh, physical mode now okay we'll uh, invite you all so, and uh, arrange for hinda next time if covid is, if covid allows us <laughs> okay hopefully and god willing yeah thank you doctor thank you doctor okay thank, thank you all thank you ma'am thank, 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 thank you stay safe thank you okay.